Hello and welcome to this, the seventh episode of Deep Space Wine. I am Kat and I'm watching an episode of Deep Space Nine for the first time before each podcast episode. And Tim, say hello, Tim. Hello, Tim. <laughs> Saw the episodes back when they were first broadcast in the UK in the 1990s and has been a fan ever since. Tonight, we're joined in the chat by Ensign the Indoor Cat. Please do say hi to her there if you're watching. Because it's the night before Halloween, and in a nod to tonight's episode of Deep Space Nine, I've thrown together a vague costume, and tonight I'm appearing as Barbecue. I'm also low on wine, so if I get to the bottom of my glass, I'll be switching to Punch, which is also themed for tonight's episode. Tonight's episode is Season 1, Episode 7, Q-less, which was first broadcast on the 7th of February, 1993, 30 years ago. I'm watching it for the first time, it doesn't hit me quite so hard, apart from when I look up the dates. <laughs> but yes, content warnings for tonight. Please. The episode involves an abusive intimate relationship, um, nothing physical there, just emotional abuse, and two people get punched in the face. And tonight Tim is kindly giving us an episode summary, so over to you Tim. Thank you very much Kat, good evening everyone. And uh, my nod to Halloween is my spooky glass, which has bats and a scary tree on it. So, thank you very much. Let us jump into it then. Yes, the plot summary, which we steal from Wikipedia because it's quick and easy, is... Lieutenant Jadzia Dax returns from the Gamma Quadrant in her runabout with a woman that Chief Miles O'Brien recognises as Vash from his time on board the Enterprise. Yes, this is the return of two characters from TNG. Although the crew is unaware of his presence, Q, a nearly Im om omnipotent prankster, was also stowed away on the runabout. During their trip back to Deep Space Nine, the vessel undergoes a series of unusual power drains. Soon after Vash's arrival, the station begins to experience similar power failures. In the meantime, Q appears to Vash, apparently infatuated with her. Although Q transported Vash to the Gam Gamma Quadrant two years earlier, she now wants nothing to do with him, much to Q's annoyance. When Dr. Bashir asks Vash out for dinner, of course he does, the horn dog, a jealous Q uses his powers to make Bashir fall asleep. Meanwhile, the bartender Quark arranges to auction off items Vash found in the Gamma Quadrant, including an unusual crystal that might fetch a high price, in every sense of the word. O'Brien spots Q on the station, recognises him from the Enterprise and warns Commander Sisko, speculating that Q may be responsible for the power drains. When confronted, Q denies any wrongdoing, although he offers no alternative explanation. Of course he doesn't, he's Q. <laughs> As the power drains become more severe, the station begins to be pulled towards the nearby wormhole. After a little needling, Q challenges Cisco to a boxing match, and suddenly they are both wearing antique-style boxing costumes. <laughs> I love that they're focused on this one scene. A few punches are thrown by Q, but Cisco is able to block the last punch and knock Q down with a single punch. Shocking Q. At the auction, Vash's crystal receives bids in excess of 1,000 bars of gold-pressed gold latinum, a substantial amount. Casually joining the bid process, Q ups the bidding to 2,501 bars, before finally bidding 1 million bars. Soon after, however, the source of the power losses is traced to the crystal itself. The crystal is quickly beamed into space before it could destroy the station. Once outside, it transforms into an alien life form and travels into the wormhole. After the incident, Bashir finally awakens from his slumber. And I love that's where the plot summary ends. <laughs> but there we have it. That is a, a slightly slightly uh, un uneven uh, plot summary. Um, and now the approach is that Kat and I will simply work our way through the episode, discussing each scene, the lines we like, and the character development that happens. So, um, Kat, mm -hmm. I know you are obviously a phenomenal fan of Q the character. Uh, you are currently watching a lot of TNG in between DS9, so I would love for you to take the lead here and, and get us started, please. Awesome sauce. I'm going to go scene by scene, because mm. if I just start talking about Q, I will not stop talking about Q. <laughs> it's unhealthy. So the first scene I really enjoy, um, it opens in Quark's bar with Bashir trying to seduce a young, succeeding in fact, in seducing a young woman by giving a story from one of his medical exams. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll, I'll be honest, I think that is a, such a lazy 90s trope that this woman would be somehow interested in his horribly convoluted, chest-puffingly 
just inaccessible boasting. It is pretty horrible. He's just throwing out a load of nonsense to medical terminology. I think ganglions are in there somewhere. Yeah. And she's sitting there looking wrapped. But it's beautifully framed with Miles O'Brien sitting just behind her and over her shoulder, <laughs> pulling faces each time Bashir makes another boast. I, I made a note here. Um, there is some fierce side eye from the chief during Bashir's boasting. It's lovely, and I, I do like that in an episode that largely focuses on two characters that are not based in DS9, mm. they are visitors to the station and visitors from a different Star Trek. Mm. Um, it starts with a character that we're very familiar with, and we know that Bashir is a horrible flirt, you know, <laughs> all the time to Jack, to um, <laughs> Jadzia Dax. So it's, yeah, it's very silly, and it is a very sitcom trope, but I think it kind of works. It's a nice, funny opening. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. O'Brien almost gags on his coffee at one point. It's just fun. <laughs> It's it's great. I think this episode, as a rule, just has a lot of opportunities for the chief to roll his eyes. Kind of like this kind of veteran Star Trek character. He's just like, oh, it's going to be one of these days on the station, is it? <laughs> Absolutely, because Q is novel to everyone else, whereas yes. he's been there through several of Q's nonsenses, mm -hmm. and he's at it by now. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but they do, they kick it off by summoning the chief and the doctor from uh, their coffee date, <laughs> their strange double date, <laughs> I'm not sure. And they're summoned to a runabout, which uh, has no power whatsoever, um, no, yeah. no life support, no nothing like that. So immediately into the tension. Um, and there's a nice bit of technical jargon mm. in that part of the script. Um, you've got Bashir and his ganglions in that first scene. Cisco mentions the geranium composite from which the runabout's hatch is composed. O'Brien asks Kira for the EPI capacitator. You're um, very good at remembering all the technical terms. I am impressed. I'm going to write them all down because <laughs> I know I won't. But I like them. They're uh, delightful. Um, I did just want to flag, actually, yes, that that, that composite uh, geranium. Um, Cisco has to point it out because Kira, confronted with a problem, pulls her gun and is just like, can I not just shoot my way in here? And I thought this is very, very character establishing. Kira would very much like to shoot something. Now she is very angry. She's very frustrated. Can I shoot the door? And Cisco has to say, well, look, you know, it is, it is basically ship armor. You will, you will be here a while if you want to cut through it. <laughs> but I love that. I just love that little one-liner. <laughs> it's nice. They do a really good job of reintroducing each character in each episode. And I think without it feeling horribly repetitive, I'm mm. still delighted to see all of them being themselves every time. Yes. Do you feel then, because obviously to you, it's, you know, we're seven episodes in, do they, mm. do they feel that you are starting to get to grips with who they are as people? Um, I mean, are the repeated actions kind of jarring or are they helpful? No, I think there's some unevenness in the way that Bashir and Dax are written in relation to each other. Their mm. flirtation fluctuates a great deal. Yeah, um, I think Bashir's respectfulness towards women, as you highlighted, fluctuates quite a lot. Um, so I think there is a feeling of the writers not quite having found level ground yet. And there's probably a difference between different episodes written by different writers and their slightly different takes on these very new characters. Yeah. Um, so I think they are doing a good job considering that it's such a, a huge group effort in terms of the writing and it being so early on. Um, the characters all feel very distinct, but I am looking forward to them getting deeper and getting more settled in who they are. Yes. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's just a reminder to chat. Obviously, this is Kat's first watch, so we're trying to avoid spoiling anything for them. So, you know... <laughs> We Some of us are veteran fans, we will know what's coming, but the best impact, as I always say in every episode, is for Kat to encounter these new for the first time, so we get that really unpolluted perspective that, that you can bring, so I'm looking All forward to All my nonsense. <laughs> nonsense, indeed, and I think this show will give you seriousness and nonsense in equal, equal droves. Um, I also just love there in the chat that Nigel, evening Nigel, misheard Duranium, which is a well-known metal in Star Trek, as Duranium which would not be very good as the, the whole of a starship. Yeah, in our accents, they are pretty much identical, aren't they? Geranium, Geranium alloy. Oh, <laughs> Geranium. Um, so then, right, yeah. um, yes, it's useful to have O'Brien here in this scene because he's the one to recognise Vash before mm. she says a word, um, which ties it in with the next generation and means that she doesn't she need introduced. much more of an introduction at that point. Um, I also, I think, realised for the first time here that Vash is mononymous. It isn't her first name or surname. It's the only name that she has. Mm. 
so this is always a weird thing that I've noticed in Star Trek, um, and it's going to come up very noticeably in DS9, and I'm not going to spoil it any more than that, but some people know exactly what I mean about this weird mononym tendency that I think Star Trek writers fall into a lot. Um, mm. And it's a little odd, I think, um, for us, but perhaps it's good in a world-building way, perhaps. You know, you don't need another signifier, another identifier. How many other bashes are you going to run into in an entire quadrant? so far and she also doesn't seem like the kind of person to take her father's given surname yep. i think she probably would strike out and either invent or get rid of a surname if she had one Absolutely. quite apart from which she's a yeah she's a, a veteran criminal <laughs> so <laughs> having only one name probably suits her in terms of being logged in databases yeah, yeah, Albeit, you know, yeah as you say that. she is pretty much the only bash so <laughs> <laughs> no you're absolutely right uh but yes it is it is very establishing, I think, that that is her only signifier. I like that. Um, I like that when they first get into... Mm. Sorry, I've got so much to say about this episode. Bring it on. When they first get into the runabout, mm. Bashir gets in there first. And he immediately goes to Dax to check that she's okay and ignores the other two people on board. There's there's, there's a man with his priorities in order. Ah, my sometime maybe hopeful girlfriend. How are you? And, and Dax and actually Dax has to say... Yeah. I'm all right. Can you can you go and help the other people? Um, <laughs> exactly. Which involves uh, an extra, an ensign, who who we see for that one scene, and he has no lines, and he's escorted off, and is never there again. So it was a bit. Sorry, little voiceless ensign. Yeah, what was that all about? <laughs> so, who knows? Who knows? Um, but no, everyone is fine. Thankfully, they get them out, and uh, everyone departs, puzzling over what caused the power, whilst a. Staffly officer is apparently working on the runabout until until the character turns around and I ah. love the first pose. He's in like this kind of hunted <laughs> goblin pose with this like He's pretending to work on the same um, exactly. system panel that um, Joe Bryan was at. But yeah, he just turns around and only the camera can see him at that point. Exactly. He's making a facial expression purely for our benefit. <laughs> and watching the others leave. I love it. It is the perfect I intro I felt for Q that he's like, nobody sees him. He turns around, hunched over, goblin and He's pose. just there, an omnip omnipotent goblin guy in the car. And he just looks like he has such, oh, what fun I shall have with these mortals. And I love it. So, oh, I love him so much. I, I know. Um, I know. Uh, uh, in the mm, scene please. where Bashir has that... Bashir has Vash. Bashir would like to have Vash. Bashir and Vash are both in the medical suite. Yes. Um, Bashir has been checking her out just to make sure that she is medically sound. Definitely right, indeed. Um, and he flirts with her, telling her that she is in remarkable shape, and then clarifies for someone who's been out of contact with civilization for over two years. And once again, Bashir is assuming that civilization equals the Federation. Everywhere else is a, God, a backwater, the yeah, yeah. wild right. frontier. Yeah. <laughs> such a knobber um and vash rightly replies that she's hardly called the gamma quadrant uncivilized mm -hmm. she's encountered cultures there with histories dating back millions of years mm. so it's the early 90s but the script writers already know that this freaking colonial nonsense is not going to fly <laughs> they're laying some some pretty hefty groundwork uh i am pleased to hear uh but you're right that was more than just i think uh bashir is now characterized um naivete but it is actually uh yeah also a bit of a bit of a reminder that yeah there is that kind of federation-esque perspective on other cultures that does not fly now that you are on the frontier and there are cultures beyond who don't know what the federation is because they're on the other side of the galaxy that's not to say they haven't developed their own vast star-spanning civilizations we'll go no further down that path but you, you, you <laughs> it is it is a stark reminder that Bashir's point of view, which you know might be a, a bit of a holdover from earlier Trek shows, where you know the Federation is always held up as the exemplar, the beacon, the defining uh, civilized culture, and it's it's just not. So that was quite jarring, I thought. It is, and it's also a nice opportunity for Vash to counter that actually. The civilizations there exist and it demonstrates that Vash has an interest in them. She is an archaeologist. Yes. It's it's emphasizing an aspect of her character in that scene as well. Which is it's just so nice, it's so neat. Mm -hmm. And a couple of casual lines between uh, two people which just looks like casual flirting, we actually established some pretty good character facets there. That that Vash is, yes, an opportunistic chancer at best and a criminal at worst, but she's also an educated woman. And um Bashir is still the same naive um 
unwitting colonialist type. <laughs> that we really in some don't. ways, very bright, as we heard from his yeah, medical exams, yeah, and in other ways, quite stupid. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, hope, hopefully just uh, naive ignorance. And, you know, the show will hopefully take him in a more developed direction. Um, the next scene I have in my uh, notes, if I can move us on from sick bay, is the assay office where Vasha's going to stash her loot. And I just love the performance by the assay office boss. Who I was... did too. I, I looked up the name of the actor. He's called Van Epperson. Van Epperson. Round of applause what, what, for, for a one scene, one note character. Loved it. Utterly believed that this was a real person because you run into bureaucrats like this all of the time. And he absolutely <laughs> delivered this scene. I love it because on paper it just sounds very straightforward. All he's doing is introducing Vash to the various security members, little uh, security measures within the assay office because Vash is storing some of the stuff she's brought from the Gamma Quadrant there. So he's just running through the technicalities um, mm. and then naming all of the items she's brought on board. But he does it with such tightly held back impatience. <laughs> <laughs> He's a deeply officious man. He only appears in this one scene, and I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. I thought he was absolutely spectacular for for these reasons. It, it, he crams so much um, believable characterization into his few lines. Uh, um, you know. Vashes. And he's right for this kind of episode, which is very comedy heavy. Yeah, he fits really well. In a, whereas in a more action episode, he probably wouldn't. Have, it would jar the plot, wouldn't it? it? Yeah, it would. But here, you know, him saying, "Actually, we have the Mark Twelve uh, device with the L Nine inverter or something like that," and you're just like, "And I really like that." Vash saying, "Have you got the Cardassian Mark Seven retinal mm. scanner?" And he's like, "It's the Mark 12. And which both tells us that he's a snob about the tech, about the uh, technology that he's using and also that time has moved on since Vash was last in the quadrant she point. knows about security measures but she's been outdated yeah no, and again it's just right. in a few words it's just so tidy it's just so nicely done god damn it it is it is it does build it does world building it does character building it gives you a laugh um it tells you that people are paying attention it's detailed it's great um, yeah, I, in I that same it. scene, we find out that they use centimeters mm. and kilograms because metric is very obviously the future. <laughs> thank you, Star Trek writers. <laughs> yes, thank heavens. <laughs> Civilization amongst the stars with some proper measurements. <laughs> um, what I did find interesting, um, and this keeps cropping up all the way through this episode, is they lovingly div um, describe all of the artifacts that Vash has brought back, and perhaps we should discuss separately about. Vash, you know, basically acquiring these objects that are relics of other cultures and bringing them back to be sold for profit. Yeah. Highly amoral at best. Um, but they lovingly describe all of them and then they get to the last object and they're like, God, it's beautiful. Uh, is it, and he says, oh, is it some kind of Promethean quartz? And she says, I thought so too. But no, it's, you know, and then she gives quite a technical, impressive description. She says, oh, no, it's uh, refraction index is too low. And I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. And then they just box it. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what, what is it? And they just don't say. Yeah, they never actually name they or describe never. it in any way. They, they just very smoothly do. gloss over the matter of the high refraction index, thing. high density, <laughs> mysterious it's, sparkly it's be, object. Yeah, it glows. It's got a really low refraction index. Would you like One to buy it? One very heavy MacGuffin. Magu that's exactly what it is. <laughs> and and rather than be like, oh, let's give it like a an unobtainium style name. They just don't <laughs> describe it. Yeah, they just don't bother. I love that. They just raise an eyebrows for a moment and put it away. Yeah, yeah. The end of says, mystery box. Yeah, yeah that's exactly what it is. Who will buy the shiny rock of mystery? And I'm like, you just describe in loving detail everything else. And they do it at the auction. And I just cannot wrap my head around in this episode that's so detail oriented that they don't describe what they think the main MacGuffin it's, is. It's a it's an attempt at a little bit of sleight of hand though, isn't it? The more attention yeah. we pay to the MacGuffin, the more obvious it is that the role that it will have to play in the plot. Whereas if you slightly glide over it, it can come back to haunt us later. There you go. This is why I think we can all agree Cat should be writing Star Trek, because they've got the handle on all the tropes needed to keep the show moving. <laughs> That's not necessarily a good thing. It needs to live and grow. Um, but this was written back in the 90s, so it can be as tropey as it likes and we can love it. This is it. I, there are good tropes and there are bad tropes, and it is our job to pick them apart, <laughs> I think. To judge every one of them. Yeah, you're not kidding. <laughs> the trial goes on, Mon Capitan. <laughs> oh, and 
as the as mm, Vash please. is leaving the SA office, mm. Cisco meets Vash and politely takes her bag, which I'm not sure he would have done had she been a male archaeology thief. I think you might be um, right. but Cisco has overheard that she's planning to leave tomorrow, and he says that the Daystrom Institute will be disappointed. And the Daystrom Institute are a bit of a um a holdover from older treks. I assume they're mentioned in the future as well. They're first mentioned mm -hmm. in the original series, they're mentioned again in the next generation. Yeah, I bumped on that as well. Love yeah, I think it's it's mostly the cybernetics division that we've heard from previously. And um, they take an interest in Android in the Android data yes. um, in TNG. And Leah Brahms, the one who developed the uh, engine for the Enterprise, that's was right. a professor there. Mm -hmm. So that's nice. It's it's just such a nice weaving of the new with mm -hmm. older material, but in a rather in a way that's far less conspicuous than us talking about it now. It's just a throwaway line that the Daystrom Institute will be disappointed that Vash doesn't come to visit them. No, I bumped on it for exactly those reasons, and I think it's good. In a world where you're constantly building everything from the foundation to up, and you're constantly introducing new things, you could say, oh, you know, the University of, of Mars or, you know, the yeah. Science Institute of wherever. But if you pick something up that's already been introduced in other shows, it's both easier and builds in that continuity that is one of Trek's strongest values, is it is yes. massive, ongoing, interweaved world. So I'd love to, to hear from it, the Daystrom Institute. Um, Dr. Richard Daystrom turned up famously in the original series um, in a, an otherwise unremarkable Star Trek episode where Kirk defeats a computer with logic, um, which happens about <laughs> four or five times. Um, but... It was also very standout because Dr. Richard Daystrom uh, was a black man, a black actor, which, as you can imagine, in, in Star Trek in, in 66 was quite remarkable. Um, so I think it's wonderful that, the, that a character introduces a one-off there who developed, you know, this wonderful computer that would replace the entire crew of a starship. Um, it was just, it was never commented. You know, he was just having to be played by a black actor at a time when that probably was not a, a conventional thing. We obviously all know that Nichelle Nichols as uh, Uhura, on the bridge, a very remarkable bit of a characterization. There were other black actors in the original series. And so I think every time one of those appears on the show, it's a great thing. It's a good thing. And it's Oh, absolutely. And to keep them as part of Star Trek lore, they don't appear in one episode and disappear. It's yeah. now the Daystrom Institute. His name will be brought up every so often in the series. It runs through all of Star Trek history and what a what a great legacy. I love that. So I also bumped on that being really, really good. <laughs> Um, and yes, in that scene, Vash says that the Daystrom Institute's Professor Wu, who Cisco says has expressed a particular interest in speaking with her again, has um, taken away her membership twice <laughs> in their archaeological <laughs> council. And Cisco comments that he is aware of this. They did so on two occasions. Something about the sale of illegal artifacts. Once again, smack, don't forget, Vash is fun, uh, but she is very, uh, yeah, She's operates a in a grey area, I think. She's quite brazen in that scene about saying that when it's a, when it comes down to a choice between science and profit, she'll take profit every time. <laughs> I love it. And, you and think, I haven't mm. jotted it down, but I think that might be the moment at which Quark overhears them and starts to take an interest. They were walking down the promenade, yes, and he is lurking again like a goblin lurking at the door of his bar. <laughs> what does it with these goblin men? <laughs> Because because we love them. <laughs> because we love them in their little gargoyle lives. Um, yes, yes. Um, the next thing I have is uh, a Brian escorting Vash to some quarters. Do you have anything before that? I don't want to rush us along, you see. Um, I've got a scene where O'Brien is describing the operation of the runabout, saying it's been operating just fine, oh, but it looks yeah. as if something's yeah. tapped into the vessel system and drained them yes. dry. And he gets to trot out a few nice phrases. The power reserves are empty, the initial da the inertial dampening fields are barely operational, and the warp drive containment fields on the verge of collapse. But there's nothing wrong with any of them. Mm -hmm. um, and also, at that point, I have to take back what I said about this series relying on subspace too much. It doesn't appear once in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we've through. usually got subspace fields. Later on, we get graviton fields, which we are do. the magical science woo for this one. <laughs> but, yeah, never let it be said that they're not diverse in their science technical jargon. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure subspace will make a reappearance pretty soon. But yes, when all the sales, it's going to be graviton fields, graviton fluxes, inertial <laughs> dampeners, obviously infamous throughout Star Trek for 
How can you accelerate so fast and turn so quickly and not get turned into chunky salsa? Are the initial dampeners handle all of that off? The... So, fine, no worries. But yes, I'd forgotten about that scene. Um, I got over it because it was it was just a bit of like you know, here's, it, here, we're establishing the mystery. Something happened to this ship. We can't explain it, and um, it was a bit techno babble heavy. So I was just like, okay. So this is the start. I'm just like, yeah, techno babble. Uh, uh, give it yeah. Yeah, 30 episodes or so from now. I'll be over it. But right now, it's very exciting. I appreciate that. Let's yeah, let's see at what point you get sick of it. It will be very interesting. <laughs> and so. I think I think in that scene, O'Brien is talking to Cisco because he also says, Vash and Captain Picard were friends, close friends. If you follow my meaning. <laughs> That was going to be my next reference. Um, and and uh, Brian also says, well, you see the captain, he likes a challenge. And I'm like, what? How well did you know Picard to describe him like that? Two, what the hell? I never, I know Vash and Picard's relationship was very, yeah, unique, but a, a challenge, I don't know. You've seen I it more mean, recently. It, it, could you? Also be, it could also be said of Picard's relationship with Q, of course. He never did like it easy. So we've gone 28 minutes, which I think is a, a very impressive. But Kat, as our undisputed expert on uh, Q Picard oh, God, relations, no. I mean, no, no. please hold forth. <laughs> I think I've probably got a bit more to say on this a bit later in the episode. I'm trying not okay. to dwell on it because, of course, Picard isn't here. But today I did find out that the slash fiction name for their pairing is Q Card. Q Card. That's brilliant. I mean, Pick, pick hard with a letter Q in the middle is right there. Pick oh my hard. god, yes, you're absolutely right. Oh. Yeah, they've jumped on the first funny pairing without actually thinking what would be more effective. This is what happens when I'm not writing slash fiction from my early teens. I, you know, I missed out. Um, the world missed out. Sorry, we're keeping we're keeping you from it. Even now, you could be you could be creating <laughs> any number. No, of... I, I I think there's too much on the internet already. <laughs> we don't need my voice adding to the chorus. <laughs> um, sorry, yes, I, I am I am I am quite a fan of reading Q in terms of both both as being asexual and yes. having a purely intellectual interest in humans, which I think this episode can also bear out, and which I'll go into a little bit later. I think, yeah, um, fascinating to hear that, because I think it yeah. does offer you multiple interpretations of... It definitely does, and I think John Delancey's portrayal of Q, he is both a an omnicognizant, omnipotent being who's just a bit mischievous, and he leans in a little bit too close. He likes whispering in ears. He doesn't do overtly sexual touching, but he no. does appear naked on the on the bridge of the Enterprise <laughs> once, and everyone stares at him for several moments. I think there are both asexual and heavily sexual readings of Q, and I think they're probably both equally valid. I, I would absolutely say that your your interpretation, whatever it may be, is completely valid absolutely yeah. if, if he... i think as long as you don't think that he's a good person at any oh, point God, no no um although even then there are a couple of episodes i think i think q started out with like orange and blue morality as tv troops put it where his moral code just does not intersect with mortals at all and then he <laughs> is in his way humanized obviously and starts to take on some of our morals so yeah, yeah I, but i do think we could possibly have a whole episode just discussing q so Which we, we mustn't do. <laughs> we, we will resist the urge. Um, but we can, you know, take pot shots as we go along, I think. Um, I do love Q's description of Picard here, of that self-righteous do-gooder. And he does, <laughs> to me, say it in tones of a slightly spurred lover. Like, ugh, he'd rather be out there saving the galaxy than spending time with me. But who's spurned lover, Tim? Who's... In the episode where he first meets Vash, um, mm. Q is trying to do Picard a favour. Mm. He owes him a favour. Um, and he's trying to do him a favour by having Picard determine for himself whether he is romantically in love with Vash or not, by mm. putting them in a situation which Picard will have to rescue her from mm -hmm. in a romantic way. So he sends them to, Sher to Sherwood Forest, <laughs> and Picard has to rescue her maid mm. Marion from certain death. Mm. Um... Sorry, I've lost my train of thought now. That's okay, that's okay. Um, <laughs> but you, you're right, it is It is one of those positions where I think Hugh is trying to stage manage Picard's life and then 
becomes that a nest in it. it really. Yes, and, and when jealous. when she meets Vash in the course of that episode, mm. it turns out they have quite a lot in common, actually, yes. including both fancying John Luke Picard. Um, and at the end of the episode, <laughs> the two of them, Vash and Q, are sitting there on a sofa in a very, oh, yes, we're a couple now <laughs> way. And Jean Luc's just sitting across the room looking a little crestfallen. And again, you can equally read that he's disappointed not to have Vash anymore, and disappointed not to have Q, and disappointed that his two crushes have gone off together. Without him, you know, in this supposedly yeah. utopian future where you'd think they'd have sorted all of this nonsense about monogamy but now. But at the same time, the thing that draws him to both of them, the thing that draws both of them to him is that they are chaotic. They are both amoral in their own ways. Yes. Picard is heavily moral. Yes. heavily rules down um, yes. and he's also interested in a lot of different things he's a fascinating person and an interesting person yes. to see the world through which we will come to later in the episode and we better, we better get on with the episode in fact because yeah. i could You're wallow right. in the next generation forever <laughs> um this... Yeah, Vash remarks that if she goes back to Earth, she will have to look in on Jean-Luc Picard, at which point Q calls him a self-righteous do-gooder. That's right. Yes, absolutely he does. And this whole scene, this whole scene with Q, finally, you know, he's out there, he's talking to Vash, and it, I just love it. I mean, I mean, every every part of this scene is glorious, from transmuting her clothes back into her bag onto her shoulder. It's so petty, I love Isn't it. Isn't it? It's such a... She's just carefully unpacked everything yeah. into closets and drawers, and he just puts all of it back in a bag and nope. puts the bag back on, on the shoulder in a second. <laughs> <laughs> it is great, it is great, and he's talking about all the things he could show her, that, you know, two years in the Gamma Quadrant isn't exactly at all the universe, and it is, it is very much, oh, come back to me, baby. <laughs> but without any promise of being there's... better. That's just it. There's, I've, I've written quite a lengthy bit here, if mm, you'll, if you'll um, indulge me. Um, there is one very unpleasant moment in that scene when Q yes. is walking towards Vash. Yes, I know. They're, in, a, they're in quarters. Yep. The bed is just there. He, she is forced to walk backwards away from him, falls backwards onto the bed, and he leans over her. He yep. doesn't touch her. No. He leans over her shoulders. Mm. He's a tall man. He's mm. a very dominating-looking man. Mm. Um, and... Although I don't think that the scene is intended to have sexual overtones in that moment, I think that to many viewers, including myself, it looks it looks yeah. as though it does for yeah. that moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we um, can't take that, definitely. It does. It looks a lot like coercion, mm. um, whether that's the motive of his character or not. Mm. Um, and I think, and it ties into something I really wanted to work out for myself here about what I think of the character Q. We've established that I like him a lot. I really enjoy watching Q on screen. Mm -hmm. And I dislike that forceful aspect of his personality in this situation. And I think it's really important that I know for myself whether I dislike that as part of the character, as he is always written, or whether I dislike the fact of him being written that way, because I could very easily say, oh, the writers in this episode didn't know what he was like, and they made him do this thing, and it's just not him. He's my darling little uwu, and he would never do that. But it fits with him as we know him. It's consistent with his previous behaviour. Um, he's manipulative, he's mm. childishly mm. selfish, he's willing to go as far as killing people. Mm if he thinks it will get him what he wants. In the Next Generation episode, Q-Who, 18 members of the Enterprise crew are killed, mm. and Q takes the Enterprise across the galaxy to the location of the Borg. Yeah. And his only motive was a childish desperation to make Picard say, I need you. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. I mean, that first... Under the fiction... Sorry. No, no, carry on. I was just going to say that very first confrontation in Encounter at Farpoint, uh, when he puts them on trial, you know, he freezes Tasha Yar, um, in, in just like a really petty but scary display of his powers. So he's clearly not above... Yeah, well, as you say, later people die, but in that instance, Tasha recovers, but it is an awful experience. And, and I remember watching that when it first was shown. I was like, that woman's been turned to ice. What the hell? So yeah. it's difficult because you see there in his first appearance, he can be violent towards women, towards everyone who is less powerful than him, which is everyone. So it does. But yes. then later portrayals of Q do, don't show him as a kind of physically violent. He's more of a chess master manipulator, makes you see things that aren't there. And 
I, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to see what hear what you think, but I feel like occasionally Q's maliciousness is written very unevenly, and this feels very out of character for Q. But you know him better than me, so please let me know what you think. I think yeah, I think my feeling was that it isn't actually out of character because we know him to be amoral, and mm. part of being immoral is he doesn't recognise the same morality that we do. We did not to excuse yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. He's a horrible, horrible person at times. He was willing mm. to put Picard and his whole crew on the trial the yeah. very first time they met an encounter at Far Point mm -hmm. for the crimes of all of humanity. He's not a reasonable person. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, it, is it all right if I read out the last little bit of um, the non oh. far too long writing? Yeah. Um, I enjoy Q's verbal spats with Picard and in this episode with Vash because Picard and Vash always remain self-assured. They're both very confident people who are entertainingly exasperated with this absurdly powerful and petty being. <laughs> and I think that it's that dynamic, someone who's less powerful than Q, but nonetheless someone who won't take any of his nonsense, yes. which makes the relationship between him and Picard and the relationship with him and Vash work. Yeah. The arguments are entertaining, but there are a couple of instances in this episode of Q abusing his power over Vash, and I don't think that's easy to watch. But I think that... I have to accept that that is actually a part of who Q is and what he does. Mm. Um, and I think realistically in these situations, that's how he would behave. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, unfortunately I touch on this again later. I wrote approximately 10 pages of A4 about this episode and I'm not going to read all of them. That's remarkable. I think what you should do is perhaps put them online somewhere so that people can read them. Um, I think I would be personally very interested to read that. So um, you should put it online and we shall... I'm not making it a part it. of linear time. This is ephemeral <laughs> and disappears the moment anyone's finished watching it. I'm not putting it there to get copy pasted in places my boss can see. Okay, okay, that's very wise. Yes, yes. Uh, Deep Space Wine <laughs> is not here to endanger anyone's professional existence. <laughs> and we get saved by Quark coming in. <laughs> looking for Vash, and Q tells him, go away. And, of course, Quark just disappears in a flash. And Vash tells Q to bring him bring back, him. and Q resentfully complies, which again fits with that. Vash is a very strong personality yes. who will stand up to Q. Yes, um, and compel him to do something. Yes, absolutely, even if he doesn't really want to. He will, because she told him to. <laughs> um, and I really like when... Quark reappears. Armin Shimmerman does a beautiful job just looking a bit. I was waiting for him to say, <laughs> Where did I just go? <laughs> I, he just what looks like. What do we all want to know? Did he disappear into nothingness? Was right? he elsewhere on the station? Was he in a bubble somewhere? We don't, we, we don't know. We never find out where people go when Q disappears, though. No, absolutely. Yeah. Fascinating. I just wanted him to say, Where was I? <laughs> but he but doesn't. The thing is, Vash is in the room, so of course he's just instantly, you know, he's. he's Bouleversé for a moment, and then suddenly Vash is there, and he's like, "Oh yeah!" <laughs> it, it, his automatic programming takes over, and Quark is here to <laughs> propose a business deal to Vash. No matter any kind of people appearing, disappearing, him appearing, disappearing, that doesn't matter. He knows what he's here to do. He brings wine, and he wants to negotiate business with Vash. But Vash has and within, dealt with Ferengi before. Within moments, she takes the upper hand by performing Umox. Umox. <laughs> First appearance of Umox on the show, and again, I think this yes. is, this is going to... I think I'd previously only seen it performed by Luxana Troy when she had to escape oh, from some Ferengis. It was TNT, wasn't it? Oh, my God, it I forgot was. about that. Yes. So, but, uh, yes, yeah, the first time in DS9, the yes. happily, and I hope we won't see it many more times. But, basically, Umox is a, um, a sexual act performed on Ferengi by fondling their ears. So it's very easily performed by any given cast member on screen without it becoming a problem for any authority on Earth. Um, but yeah. I still yeah. find it really, really... I'm not a squeamish man, but I, I just... Because I can see what it represents, I still find it really odd. And, and you know, if you, if you basically compare it to the equivalent human approximation, it would be massively inappropriate. So... I find yeah. the whole concept of Umox. I mean, I can see how it fits into Ferengi culture. Absolutely, you know they're they're you know comically misogynistic. Um, but I just found this really weird. It was great for Vash, you know, she got total control over the situation. But 
what did you yeah see? i think he was offering her a 50 50 split of the artifacts that they would sell together mm -hmm. and she wheedles him down to about 12 percent and, and 22 is. which is which is still a really still impressive maneuver but to do so by basically provoking I think, actually it's just incredibly I, weird i really like the brazenness of it i like the fact that it wasn't picked up on by once removed from the show yep. <laughs> and it's yeah it is it's always kind of um it's entertaining whenever there's an alien that has very prominent features that turn out to be an erogenous so <laughs> <laughs> it's just a really it's a bad joke but it's, uh, it works in context i think and it does it and it does show us the lengths that vash is willing to go to she is a proud independent woman but yep. god damn it if profits in, in there somewhere she will do it i i, I like it because it, uh, we've already established that quark is this canny businessman and then vash is like guess what i'm better you know, I've done this more. And she just yes. walks all over him. It's great. <laughs> she is extremely Ferengi in this episode and looking back before then. Mm. Not in terms of being misogynistic, but certainly in terms of doing whatever it takes yeah. to acquire what she wants. Yes. I would absolutely yeah, and I, I really like the pairing up of her and Quark in this episode. I think it's that was great. a very shrewd move and it works really, really. well. Really, really good. Um I did like that when uh, Q returns, he describes Quark as a disgusting little troll. I love that line. <laughs> I just love that description. And I can I can kind of see it. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm just responding yeah. to Nigel in the chat who pointed out that it's probably not important, but, but pick, putting a Q in the middle of the word Picard only works when it's written down, whereas Q card works verbally as well, which is fair. Yeah. But yeah, I think most slash fiction is, is written, written rather than... I'm not aware that anyone sits around reading it over wine you know, to a group of assembled friends, but that might be a nice way to spend an evening. You have a very, very permissive group of friends, but yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> people go out, be, be, be cool. I love it. <laughs> but yes, um, mm. the Umox is interrupted by Bashir coming in to check on Vash without having a good excuse. Um, oh, dear. He offers to buy her dinner, saying the Quark's bar serves a delicious couscous, which I thought was quite possibly a nice nod to um, Alexander Siddiq's Sudanese heritage. Yes. Um, Dr. Bashir might well want to eat couscous. And while he is talking to Vash, Q appears over Bashir's shoulder without his knowledge and saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, it is just so childish. Invading that physical space and, and credit to Siddiqui Fadl for not reacting to John Delancey being like that close. <laughs> you know, very commendable acting tops. And every time someone disappears in or out of shot, Q appears over his shoulder, disappears again. Mm. And the actors and the editing team have actually done a fantastic job of making it look seamless. There yes. isn't obvious pausing for extra moments while mm -hmm. someone appears or disappears. It, it happens is. very quickly. It is. Uh, very which must smoothly. have been a technical challenge, but oh, it's, God, yeah. yeah, it's very nicely done. Mm. No, no, I was impressed with that as well because uh, it can't have been easy to achieve. But kudos, as you say, to the team. Uh, very impressed. Uh, the next thing I have uh, is Bashir waiting for Vash at the restaurant. Have I? Oh, I've 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 got something else from that scene. Um, Bring it on. When Bashir has left, Q says, "These mating rituals you humans oh, indulge yes. in are really quite disgusting," <laughs> <laughs> which to me backs up asexual Q theory that he isn't that interested in the act or the ritual of sex, and he actually finds it a bit gross. Yeah, um, yeah, I can see that, but but also. Um, the rituals, and he, I, I, I took it that he also finds the rituals quite amusing, quite entertaining. Because obviously we know he followed uh, Picata Riser when he first met Bash, so he clearly has some <laughs> professional interest in how these funny mortals chase each other around. I don't know. I've, I've actually written a bit about him and Picard here as well. Um, <laughs> okay. There's a moment in the Cupid episode of TNG where. He said, where Q says to Picard about Vash, she's found a vulnerability in you, a vulnerability I've been looking for for years. If I'd known sooner, I would have appeared as a female. <laughs> and there's a nice playfulness in the conversations with Picard, which leaves room both for the possibility that Q is just manipulative and wants to spend time on the Enterprise because of the adventures it would afford him. And that is interesting, Picard might be the 
for Picard as an individual, it might be of a romantic nature. All he wants in the next generation is for Picard to need him and yeah. to let Q be yeah. around him. Yeah. And in the episode Tapestry, he wants to show Picard that the Jean-Luc Picard has become is the best version of himself, I despite don't. Picard having regrets about his past. Mm. Um, Q is, I've written that Q is mischievous, mysterious, infrequently generous and fascinated with Picard, all of which makes him kind of adorable, apart from all those times where he manipulates, harms or kills people. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think, I think that there was, a, there was a trend amongst certain Trek fans to just write off Q episodes as just silly, which I think is far too reductive. They're not. Okay, on their I, surface... I yeah. I can't understand why, because in terms of how the universe operates, he's too simple. He's massively overpowered. Yes. Um, so there had to be such a careful treading of the dynamic with him and Picard, whereby Picard doesn't just go, I'm not talking to you, get off my ship. Off my ship. Can't stand you. Get off my ship. Mm -hmm. He's got to be able to converse with him. But at the same time, Picard can never befriend him, because if he did, you call on Q whenever something goes wrong. The Borg have come back. Q. The Romulans are playing up. Q. Yeah, Klingons are... Right fighting over who claims they will. Q, come and sort it out. You just can't do it. It's got mm. to remain antagonistic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's played, yeah, it's played really well and I find it very entertaining, but it does. And again, I say more about this later, but Q does a lot of lampshading of this world. He uh, points yes. to the fact that yes. it's a fictional universe, which if you're a hardcore Trek fan who likes to imagine what it is to live in that world, Q breaks it he every does. time. He, he, does. he doesn't fit more. No, no, he absolutely doesn't. Um, I just, I think for the benefit of the chat and for you, really, um, Q has a much bigger part in Star Trek Voyager. Mm. Massively so. And, and it's, it's probably the best, I would say it's slightly better for Q as Voyager than even TNG. But um, Kat has obviously not seen Voyager and uh, we don't want to spoil them by giving them any spoilers. So please, nothing about Voyager either. But, um, you know... In 20 years' time, when we finally finish the uh, DS9 watch, we could watch Voyager, <laughs> and, and, and you would have acres and acres to dig into. Or, you know, if you just actually have a life, you could just go and watch it at your leisure and come back and tell us what you thought, because I think it will be really interesting to see what you make of Q. This is assuming an awful lot about me in 30 years' time, that I'll have anything else to do. <laughs> same. Same. <laughs> Absolutely the same. <laughs> but I do... Invested for life. After Voyager, we've got Enterprise, and then we've got Disco, watching... and then we've got Picard. I'm not watching. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Right. DS9, because I love it, it's my favourite, and you'd never seen it before. But that's it. Anything after that is, like, real bonus territory. But as we established in a previous episode, it's going to take us a long time at the rate we're going to get through DS9. So... We'll put that on the oh, back corner. The, the indoor cat has said in chat mm. that she will be here. Thank you. So, yeah, Instant we're in, cat. Tim. Are you really going to be the holdout? No. I'll come back if I'm not dead from, like, liver failure we'll, or something god-awful. We'll see indoor cat. We'll bully him into it. We'll get there. Anyway. Move us along, in the next In the next scene, Q appears as a Bajoran waiter in Quark's bar and hypnotises Bashir into being too tired to have dinner with Bash. <laughs> It it's is, so petty. It is the most chaotic scene I've ever seen. <laughs> it's, even, it's, it's not even a, a finger snap. He actually does the... And it's like... looking a bit tired, actually. And I'm like, <laughs> what is this? Is this primary school it's so prank? It's stupid. It is so stupid. And, 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 and Bashir's like, I love Bashir's line. My God, you're an impertinent waiter. I love that line. It's the most incongruous line in possibly all of Star Trek. And it just, I love it. I also love that they went to the trouble of, for a scene that lasts, what, a couple of minutes? They put Q in Bajoran nose the, ridges, yeah, the whole earring, thing. The, whole, the thing. whole outfit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant, brilliant scene. Um Bashir as well, uh, I just want to highlight another line I love. Bashir says, you know, uh, I think I'll go for a lie down. And Q quips at the side of his mouth, maybe you'll do it on your own this time. And I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> Q clearly knows that Bashir's a little bit of a horn dog, you know? And I thought, he oh, is a little bit little. on the cognizant, yeah. And then as just after Q said that, I walked away, <laughs> O'Brien comes up behind him and goes, oh, bloody hell. And I love that line as well. That whole scene has three of the best lines in the episode <laughs> in it. You know, I just, 
I absolutely love it. It's two minutes and it is some of the best writing in the entire bloody episode. I love the thought of O'Brien once again in that one line solidifies his position as the everyman. I'm I'm not, you know, an alien or a career Starfleet officer or any kind of weird complication. I'm just a guy trying to do a job. And now there's this trickster god and he just says a, such a heartfelt bloody hell that I think all of us could resonate with. He is us in that situation. It's I not me. If it. I saw Q, I wouldn't be that exasperated by him. But yeah, if you actually had to live in a universe with him where he can decide whether you live or die, oh, bloody hell, is absolutely the right response. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought. I love it. I love that whole scene. <laughs> it did have to be O'Brien as the indoor cat. It does. He is, he is, he is the human weather vane of DS9. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, it's O'Brien who then goes up to the uh, the crew, the team, and tells mm -hmm. them that Q is on board. And happily, Cisco was at a briefing on Q two years ago. <laughs> and was... it's it's very good for Q mm. that they didn't focus on Q's role in introducing the Borg to the Federation, yes. given how Cisco's wife died of that Borg. Is a very good point. That is a very good. Oh, the never, whole I think the whole it. episode would have been eaten up by it had yeah, they gone into right. that. So they just they just sidestep it. They don't mention it the um mm. the seminar that uh, cisco went to just taught him that he was a, a trickster god who mm -hmm. has outlandish powers and who occasionally pops up and causes problems and you, they leave it there you could possibly hand wave it perhaps uh, in universe that you know um it's classified information i don't know if this episode is in universe before or after um best of both worlds I think it's possibly before, before, so perhaps um, Starfleet doesn't want knowledge of the Borg getting too far out, so they might have just completely glossed over that, which is, you know, which is why. Uh, um, uh, who knows? Anyway, we're getting we're getting bogged down in minutiae that doesn't help us, which is such a Star Trek. But yes, O'Brien kind of fleshes yes. out for a bit that um, of a bomb. Yeah, that he, he's seen Q before. Yep. That Q, he met him in Sherwood Forest. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Brilliant line. Oh, and Bob Ryan also points out that for the first time in a month, there's nothing wrong with any of the station systems. I love that bit, yes. I love Which that. it just nicely ties in with the, the very few episodes that have gone before where there have been endless technical difficulties mm -hmm. for the station. And now, at the point where everything is working, stuff is mysteriously going wrong. And it's definitely a new problem to solve. So they can skip over all of the it's just Cardassian tech, it's broken, we've got a thousand things to fix. No, it's mm -hmm. one new unique problem mm -hmm. which we've now got to focus on solving this damn graviton field and the graviton fluxes. Mm -hmm. It's a nice a little bit of establishing of drama, you know, actually for once DS9 is operating normally, so this is a new real threat. And obviously everyone makes the connection. We've got this unexplained problem and we have an unexplained problem called Q. You know, so they make an obvious connection. Uh, that uh, yeah, O'Brien cool, yeah. said it's got to be Q. Another one of his stupid jokes, and Cisco deadpan as anything. I'm not laughing. Couldn't be delivered by anyone else in all of Star Trek except for Benjamin Cisco. It was just. It's uh, so grave. It's perfect. It's just such a perfect foil for Q in this episode. Uh, and and uh, absolutely brilliant because that's what I have next. Um, is that uh, Cisco goes down to Quarks where. Fashion Quark are obviously setting up their uh, their little uh, market auction, and uh, and uh, yeah, Cisco's like, I want to talk to Ash, and of course, like, uh, the lady and I are in a business agreement, and he's just like, no, <laughs> and, and Quark looks over his shoulder, like, okay, okay, perhaps I better get out of the way then. <laughs> Oh, but before he does leave, Quark has the wonderful line, I can't decide what's more intoxicating, the Gamsian wine or your negotiating skills. And I love the whole that. episode is just a series of great quotes strung it, together. I thought the exact same thing. There were so many brilliant one-liners in this episode. It is such a brilliant standout collection of writing. Um, and I also found that that line from Quark is clearly a term of great professional respect. Quark you know, is very enamoured of Vash, not only because she's a beautiful woman, but because she is everything a Ferengi would admire. A shrewd negotiator, yeah. a manipulator, <laughs> able to gauge the value of things in an eye blink. One hustler to another, One absolutely. To another. <laughs> it's such a good scene. Um, but yes, then Cisco uh, banishes Quark, sits down and says, let's talk about Q. Who better to talk about <laughs> Q than Q? And this obviously is probably the linchpin scene for the whole show. Yeah. So 
But I, I love that Q turns around from the next table. Mm. And as you've pointed out before, the soundscaping on the promenade is fantastic. There's the clinking of cutlery. Yes. There are people talking. It makes sense that in that crowded space, Q could turn around from the next table without the whole room going... Who's that guy? It's not 10 on? forward. It's not silent. If Q had done that in 10 forward, everyone would be going, oh my God, it's Q. Yeah. But everyone's talking. There's chatter in the background. It makes perfect sense. Mm. It just turns around and goes... Oh. And is that, it's, it's great. It works. It and it means that when Q disappears, everyone else except Cisco a few moments yeah. later and silence falls, it's stark. There's a nice difference there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, God, it is, it, th this scene is great. So let's let's try and get through as much of it as we can. Um, yes. Okay. Well, I think the first thing Q does is insulting Cisco, saying, is Starfleet penalizing you or did you actually request such a dismal, dismal command? <laughs> I love that line. And Cisco just glares at him. He's not going to play. He just sits there looking very angry. Absolutely does. Um, th th I also made a note that he describes it as a dreary gulag. I thought, what a beautiful does. image. I mean, a terrifying image, but a beautiful one. It's, it perfectly encapsulates Q's view of this place away from all of the exciting places that Q has apparently been. Mm -hmm. um, I think my favourite line from this scene is when Q says, let's not be hasty, my happy-go-lucky friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which gets the measure of Cisco so perfectly. You know, and, and he's got this, that stone face of, oh, I'm not putting up with this shit. And Q's really like, right, I've got your measure, pal. I know exactly how to get under your skin. It is... It is brilliant. Um, what was I going to say? I've completely lost it now. There was oh, something sweet. else. Uh, no, no, I've lost it. It's fine. So uh, next thing I've got is um, heavy is the burden of being me. Because <laughs> it's such a Q line. <laughs> isn't it just Cisco accuses Q <laughs> of being related to the, uh, the Graviton Flux. Um, oh, yes, once again, I am the galaxy's whipping boy. Heavy is the burden of being me. <laughs> textbook Q. I mean, textbook. He's coming into this one episode. You know, a TNT's run of complaints, and I love it. <laughs> love oh, there's, there's one line that goes before that, mm, which... Please. Oh, one of my complaints with this episode, Q has the line, I must admit, I like your new tailor. And he's only referring to the uniform. And of course, a moment later, he's wearing the, yes. um, the new DS9 uniform because yes. he was previously wearing the TNG era uniform. Yes, that's right. um, but when he refers to the new tailor, I wish Garak were in this episode. I wish he were there to have a short conversation with Q to that... have the two of them threatening each other, the oh. two of them talking about what each of them knows. That it would, would be... have been such rich ground, and it it can't happen because I know this is the only Q episode of DS9, and Garak doesn't turn up till the next season. Season two, yeah, you're oh. absolutely right. I think that would be dangerous. I think those two characters <laughs> would dominate the entire episode. You could put anything else. You could put the Borg in this episode and everybody would be talking about uh, that scene with Q and Garak. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. I, I, I would get too obsessed with it, I'm afraid. It's probably mm. as well it doesn't exist. Mm, mm. But I'll run good. It is a shame. It is a shame. Um, but yes, yeah. Um, so yes, Cisco suggests let's talk in private. Q vanishes everyone, and it's quite a, quite um. After all of his frivolity and oh, I'm such a merry japester, it's quite an. It's that flip side of Q where he's malicious. Cisco's like, "Ops, there's no one." Just and again, we never find out what has happened to go? all the people who's disappeared. Yeah. And, they could and, all be dead, as far as Cisco knows. Which is, I think, explains Cisco's next action, which is to lose his call. Cool. He grabs Q, he pulls him close, and, and there is a roughness in his voice. You bring them back right now. And you you feel Cisco's rage coming through Avery Brooks's portrayal. Um I love just that that moment. And it's it's brilliant. And it's that it's rage born of not only anger that his authority has completely been flouted mm -hmm. by someone who he cannot hope to face up against, mm -hmm. but his care for everyone about the exactly station. What I got. It's his yeah. concern. They are his people, his crew, his station, and he will not put, have them put in harm's way like this. And I, th I think where we've seen Picard bark at Q and be like, Q, return them immediately. You get the feeling that Cisco is like, I'm serious, I'm going to stop breaking I will shit. fucking end you. Right? You yeah. get it. You get it. And it's, it's such a wonderful contrast for us coming into a new Star Trek show. As we've talked about, the contrast distinguishing DS9 from TNT, we're like, 
this is not Jean Luc Picard. This is and someone else. And I, I like that characterization of Cisco because in my notes mm. I initially wrote mm. that while Q is very mischievous and flamboyant, Cisco is very calm. And yeah. Cisco isn't a calm man. He's, he's a man who is constant. Mm. I don't know that he's always angry under the surface, but he is he is quick to anger when things go badly wrong, which they yes. constantly do. He is yes. a very emotive person yes. who holds it together well, I think. Yes. It's quite a complex characterization. It isn't yeah. just yeah. he immediately angry or he uses his anger quickly no. he doesn't it's it's there simmering and occasionally comes up mm -hmm. in moments like that when he grabs q mm -hmm. i think you're absolutely right and for that um humanizes him a bit more um it's 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 not the monolithic starfleet which would only promote somebody like jean-luc picard and a succession of very mm -hmm. similar captains and admirals we met in tng it's like actually there are going to be very human characters who are you know, Cisco is clearly an excellent commander, excellent at his job, a great leader of people. His occasional personality, you know, changes. These, these, these totally reasonable, you know, situations of reactions to stress aren't, shouldn't be an obstacle to being an officer, you know, or, or just a believable human being. So I think it's, I think it's great. I love that it. it is a great bit of characterization for Ben Cisco. That was my impression. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's yeah. I think Avery Brooks really has mm. a handle on the character at this very yeah, early stage. I would agree. For all that, I I don't know how he develops after this, so I can't say how consistent that is. But it does feel as if yeah, Avery Brooks has gone in with a very strong feeling for who and how this character is. And I would agree. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. Um, so this is it. Now Q knows he has got the measure of his man, and he's like, Cisco is an angry man. You know, um, Picard will get teed off in a very British way, but Cisco is angry. So, why don't we settle this mano a mano? And it's possibly one of the best scenes in all <laughs> of Star Trek. So, Kat, once again, please take us through. I had feelings about this scene, okay? Let's do it. Oh, okay. The boxing scene, as as you mentioned, in, in one of the online summaries, it mm. has a very prominent place. Mm. And... Rightly so. It is the two strongest characters perhaps facing off against each mm. other, Q and Cisco. Yeah. And it feels to me like it should be a highlight of the episode, but for whatever reason, this scene doesn't entirely work for me. And I think Sweet. it's because it doesn't quite go far enough in terms of the scene setting, which sounds petty as hell, but I'm, I'm going to run with it. Mm, we have to remember that Q is omnipotent. He can go anywhere. He can do anything with or to anyone at any time yeah. in the episode Cupid in TNG he takes the entire bridge crew and Vash to Sherwood Forest they yes. filmed the episode in a wood they've got a whole castle set that they run around <laughs> and this boxing scene from an, for an omnipotent being is very small there isn't a boxing ring yeah. there is no change of setting they're still in the bar with a crowd of cheering onlookers who suddenly appear they're all wearing crew uniforms they look they're like the, pa the patrons of of course. Yeah. yeah, we can assume that he has brought back some of the patrons to cheer them on. Which seems, um, I see what you mean, yeah, which seems like a, a, a very small scale alternative to a, a man who can I conjure Sherwood, okay. Exactly. I suspect that it was due to budget constraints that all, and all that they wanted to keep it there on the station because that is the remit of DS9. Everything happens there. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there isn't a boxing ring. There isn't any sound effect other than the ringing bell to mm. indicate that it's a boxing scene. And I think this is my, oh, I had a good idea for this episode. <laughs> I think that what would have made it work would have been to have, A, a boxing ring with some ropes around it. Nothing huge, just small enough for two men to stand in. Yeah. And to a shot this, that scene, that part of that scene in either sepia or black and white. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just one thing that Star Trek, and I'm, I'm, I'm on my soapbox now, I'm going to carry on. Sweet, one thing that Star is. Trek <laughs> keeps tiptoeing up to with Q and never quite going full pelt with is his Deadpool-like ability to see the tropes and character arcs that are going on around him. Oh, in The Next Generation, he tells Picard that swooping in and saving the day at the last minute won't work this time. He says that Riker is now so stolid, he was never like this before the beard. And he lampshades the fact that this is a developing fictional world and he can see how it's unrolling. Yeah. And this would have been a great opportunity to have Q set the scene, not only for Cisco, but for the viewing mm. 
audience. Mm. He doesn't even need to look at the camera. You just show that he's put it in black and white. This can be what Cisco's seeing, but he's also showing us. And it would have made it more vintage looking. It would have set the scene a bit further. It just would have made it that bit more satisfying than just, oh, we're in a ring of people and I'm going to punch you. <laughs> it just needed something. I think for me, that was it. It needed something just to make it a bit more otherworldly and a bit more cue-ish. Wow. Do you feel, do you feel, <laughs> do you feel purged having, having uh, shared that with us? <laughs> I feel a bit calm, yeah. Thanks. Cool. Who needs to pay for therapy? <laughs> if our podcast can help anybody with, with that, we will be very, very grateful. I think you make some very good points that I'd never, ever considered. And I would say that I know Star Trek is capable of exactly what you're talking about. My only... Uh, clarification then I suppose will be that again it might have been a budget pushback uh, it might have been uh, a producer pushback who were like you know we don't want too much weirdness you know we know what Q's like and we're still establishing this show so let's not go completely off the rails and have like a whole <laughs> pocket dimension just where it's Cisco and Q punching each other in you know some you know turn of the century British gym um, and it's fair when you know, when the scene has ended, they can both turn and walk away into the rest of the ship. They're not yeah. in a completely separate space where Q has all of the power. They're still in the promenade where Cisco is in charge. So yeah, when Q gets a couple of light punches in and then Cisco decks him <laughs> and knocks him to the floor, Cisco is standing in his own surroundings. Um, having won. So there probably is something in that. I, I, yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, uh, yeah, I think you made some very good points, but I hope it doesn't detract from the, the enjoyment. And, um, you know, also I was very curious what you thought about seeing Q, even, even in a tiny way, put on the back foot. Did you find that that did anything to your perception of the character? <laughs> I, I I think it should make me respect him a bit less. He's meant to be omnicognizant, for God's sake. And it's not right? as if he was unprovoked. He fucking punches Cisco twice. Yeah. He's either punched or just narrowly missed. Me. You can't quite tell. I think there are sounds of his fist connecting lightly with Cisco's Very lightly, fist yeah, yeah. Him. And the character's so, head does yeah, yeah, push he, back. He punches Cisco lightly twice. He's already hit the man twice. What what exactly did he expect him to do? This is it. This is it. <laughs> and it and it was a nice way in the writing for Cisco to get the upper hand when Cisco doesn't have anything like Q's power no, absolutely <laughs> um, to not. manipulate things. But he can stand his ground and knock the man over, and he, mm, does. he does. And it's yeah, it's a satisfying moment for Cisco. I think I I don't know. I felt it was slightly unearned because it happened so quickly. <laughs> Um, I, I, and I, I, I don't do know. That. I think I just had the feeling it should have been an absolute standout moment. It should have been, oh, fuck yeah, that was brilliant. And it just didn't quite hit home for me for whatever reason. I think that's completely legitimate. Um, it, I love it, but I think because even that one little victory is kind of the most that anybody's ever gotten over Q. So I've always looked back on it now. <laughs> And because it's so early in Cisco's arc, that it, it, obviously yes. it, is, it is a character de defining moment. So, although it, you know, taken in a wider context, doesn't really land as heavily as yeah, perhaps you might hope. I would, I would look, I do look back on it and go, wow, that's an incredible moment. <laughs> um, although... there's, there's also one one other thing that happens at the end of this scene, which I'm disappointed that they couldn't follow up on. Um, when Q has been punched and is lying on the floor, he says, oh, after Cisco says, I'm not Picard. I mean, that's um, brilliant. Q replies, you're much easier to provoke. How fortunate for me. And that could have, if they brought Q back in one other episode later on, there could have mm. been a moment when Cisco's anger gets the better of him, mm -hmm. a moment when Cisco goes too far with something. Mm -hmm. And Q could have turned up and told him off and they could all have lived and learned and loved and grown. <laughs> but it can't happen in DS9. It's a very different kind of show. It and again, we cannot, really we can't rely on Q to turn up and resolve problems. I guess he's, yeah, we can probably say that Q is a bit like the, um, the sonic screwdriver in Doctor Who. He can be there, Good he can comparison. be involved in situations. He cannot resolve a situation for them because... No. It'd be cheating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and all they can do is try and guide the humans to do what which, he feels they should. It, it's exactly, I do think it's the way that Trek best treats Q, and he does it in this episode, mm -hmm. and he's done it in other episodes. Which is, you know, he will, 
if he feels it's completely necessary, he will nudge them. And you, there are tiny nudges, you know, <laughs> which we see later on in the episode where Q is trying to push them in the right direction. Um, so it's an interesting flip side to Q's personality where he does seem to have some kind of not responsibility to individual humans, but humanity. He seems to feel that that whole yeah. that whole overarching trial of humanity. I think cuts both ways. He's like, I'm going to punish you for your mistakes, but I will help you in my own weird way. Be slightly yeah, better. at the end of the next generation, when there is a an anomaly whereby the entirety mm. of humanity might never exist, and Q just one. gently nudges Picard to do the right things across three different time zones to try and ensure that the right thing happens. But yeah, Q doesn't think oh my favorite pet's in trouble i'll just go back and save everybody he just yeah he seems to have some respect for I think narrative so. continuity whatever it is human he, history he, there's something there that he's working to preserve i think based rather on than manipulate himself yeah yeah well exactly but i think you're right i think it is between narrative continuity and and personal responsibility because obviously as you say q is uh, the deadpool he is a ways in a fictional universe i think so he's uh knowingly pushing it along um but yes the way that scene wraps up where he does land one on q and q honestly looks hurt and says you hit me picard would never hit me and and cisco says i'm not picard it's 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 very on the nose in every sense of the word <laughs> but um it is also i think you know a helpful distinction it, it's it's the cap on what we've been talking about cisco losing his temper mm -hmm. being protective of his crew and a lot of ways acting like picard wouldn't um and it is really important that mm -hmm. in an episode that's largely based around q and vash we've got this standout moment for the commander on the yeah. station yeah. he gets that moment and he gets his his victory in there when they needn't have had that scene in there. No, it could not have right. happened and the story could unfold the same way, but they did it. Um, mm. And it does feel important for him as a character, I think, mm. that he got to assert his authority there. I would absolutely, absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, an odd scene. I love it, but I can, I'm can. i not blind to the very real valid criticisms you have raised there. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you have next on the board? Next up, um, I've got the one aspect of everyone believing that Q is the problem is that it occurs to no one to politely ask him to solve it for them. <laughs> because everyone on the crew is running around going, right, Q's causing this. We've got to try and solve it. Why, can't, why is Q doing this to yeah. us? No one just says, Q, what's happening and how do we solve it? Because they assume that he's working against them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so he just neatly leaves out that... Um, that rather silly way that they could have tied it up because it doesn't occur to them. Plus, and it would be the sonic screwdriver solution, wouldn't it? Exactly. In, but it's a nice in-world justification for them not thinking to do that. They've got every reason to distrust him. Um, and there's there's one, so many little moments. There are lots of moments in this I enjoyed and a few moments that irked me. Mm. And one of them is that O'Brien says that there are hull breaches all over the station, mm -hmm. and we cut to a shot of the exterior of the station. There is no obvious damage. It's just a normal shot of the station. Yeah, you're absolutely right, because they haven't got the money to film, presumably, an external yeah. shot, which sits very weirdly with my next note, which is uh, that they have a hull breach in ops, and it's visible. Mm -hmm. There's wind blowing and everybody's yes. hair and there's stuff flying around, and I'm like, this is very strange for Star Trek, because whenever... The Enterprise gets damaged, there's just the camera shakes and there's sparks somewhere, you know. So yeah. it was such a weird physical representation of damage to the station. They really threw me. And I don't think we've seen it again. Yeah, it is, it is in keeping with what they've done in previous DS9 episodes. Do you remember the one where a door got blown up and there is smoke throughout the whole space? Oh, yes, that's right. So that when you get yeah. the back view, the characters have obviously been affected by the explosion that that's took place in front point. of them. Mm. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think they, they have got a really that? strong sense of internal continuity for yes. the special effects 100%. and what's going on. But yeah. They can't show and it. <laughs> they can't, they can't they film they more modern budget, shots. <laughs> a little while later, we see the thrusters being used for the first time. The thrusters that you stabilize the station ah. in its position in space and we see those the blue flares coming off the station i think the scene where the hole isn't at all damaged was just a i think it might just have been they forgot to put or, or maybe there are visible cracks in it that i couldn't see it, it, you know that's not impossible because obviously ds9 has not been uh, digitally remastered so it's all still shot on like kind of 90s oh. film tape so it doesn't show it's there in the fuzz also observe that this isn't the first time we've seen the thrusters they were used in the very first episode oh, to I move apologize. DS9 to the world. 
apologize you that you cannot course, remember everything they did, didn't they? yes so i think it's a reuse oh, of of the thruster shot from the very first episode <laughs> um and that just kind of lends weight to that theory that where possible they can't just do new things, which is a shame. But you know, I'm and happy I, to I be think corrected. a lot of the tech budget on this one probably went on shooting and reshooting scenes where people are appearing and disappearing yes. and having costume changes yes, while appearing yes. and disappearing. Yes, That's a lot of time right. people I was gone. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. Um, um, oh, I've noted that in this scene they make heavy use of the term graviton, um, graviton. which is a hypothetical quantum of gravity, mm. i.e. tiny things, what make gravity happen. <laughs> um, Thank you, Professor Cat, for the science influx there. Yes, graviton is a very, a very uh, favoured Star Trek term to uh, use for anything that's, you know, not vague enough that subspace could cover it. Uh, but it's nice that they presumably had consultants and they've drawn something that actually appears within string theory, within quantum theory. Um, it has its place. And I don't know yes. whether what they do with them is consistent with current theory yeah. about uh, <laughs> gravitons, but it's, it's nice that it's in there. It is. It is um, a little a little sprinkling of believability that I think is the kind of stuff that holds Star Trek together sometimes. So, no, I also in, enjoyed the many references to graviton and why that's making you know, the station literally start to come apart and move. So yeah, I think I think it's a nice little uh, addition there. Um, I have next. And, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say at the end of that scene, mm. Cisco said to Dax, "I'm not convinced that Q's behind this. Yes. Playing with the lights and punching holes in the hole doesn't strike me as his style." Which I think Which... we would agree with, wouldn't we? We yeah. wouldn't also see Q like that from our knowledge of him on on the Enterprise. That's not. No, absolutely. If if he gets involved and messes things up, he does it on a grand scale. Oh, He's taking know. everyone to you another know. part. Of this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It it doesn't do petty things like stopping individual systems from working. Yeah. It's it, it's small fry to him if it mm. doesn't involve mass destruction. He's not interested. I think you're absolutely right, and uh, therefore it's, it's it's a nice little scene for Cisco to be like. I know there's something more going on here. I'm not going to fall for the obvious conclusion, which is that Q's being a dick and kicking holes in my station. <laughs> there is something else going on here. So it was it was helpful. It was it was helpful. I thought to move it along. Um, mm. So yes. Yeah, so the next scene I've started making notes on, but tell me if you've got anything before this is Odo summoning yes. Quark to his office. What another brilliant scene! <laughs> oh, I love this one. Garrick and Bashir are probably my favourite duo to see on mm. screen together, but yeah, Quark and Odo are a close second. Same. Um, so, uh, well, I've, I've been... jotted down one of some mm. of my favourite quotes from it if you want to hear them. Well, the the the, the, work, the first one that grabbed me was um, uh, Quark saying, uh, "You were listening in on our conversation. What were you this time? The table, the chairs, <laughs> you were the wine bottle." And the after because they were drinking from that. They were drinking from, and I'm like, I don't know if I, I, Odo what does feel things. What are you imagining, Quark? I mean, it's just, I mean, I've heard of some pretty out there kinks, but, you know, you know, turn into a bottle and pour things out of me. Wow, okay, you know, hey, the future, anything goes. But what must that feel like if you're a container and you're holding fluid? It boggled my mind, and thankfully Odo just glosses over, and he's just, his line, his next line to be with me. Brilliant. When are you going to learn? You have no secrets from me. I love it. Delivered with such brilliant bile and vitriol by Rene Obersonis. I love it. I just love it. It's great. And it takes someone of Quark's easily distracted by shiny thingsness not to dwell on that and get incredibly paranoid. I think many a person would be put off wrongdoing by that. But no, Quark yep. will just continue to do his business deals and be horrified every time Odo this finds out. It. This is it. And it, it plays into what you and I have discussed about Disney, which is, you know, almost every episode now they've shown Odo be something. And then suddenly he's no longer a rat or part of the wall or a bag or something. Oh, yeah. Today, while reading memes on the internet, oh, yeah. I came across the horrifying realisation that Odo does not wear clothes. <laughs> I can't remember if we've discussed it before. I've blocked it from not, my mind. We've but... not discussed it because it probably requires a whole separate discussion of how the hell we interpret, yeah, Odo. Um, and, and Walking fact... around naked all the time. His clothes are a part of him because they also turn into the background. Exactly. But then Odo, is he naked? Because if you come down to it, Odo's natural state is liquid. 
Yeah. You know, as we say, he he he. he... So if he forms a hard outer case, then you know, or a fabric outer case, maybe that counts as being clothed. Uh, I, I mean, theoretically, yes. I, there, there, there is going to be a scene in a later episode where he's actually tweaking his outfit, and 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 he. Um, what does that mean? Um, he he, he adds a belt. Um, <laughs> he grows a belt. Did he it's... lose mass from another part of his I body? I don't know. <laughs> nobody. What would, what, ha what would happen if he grew his hair? <laughs> But then again, he can make most of his mass disappear to turn into a rat. So who knows? Maybe he's got a pocket dimension where he stores his spare self. You are pulling on a thread that is never properly clarified <laughs> in all of DS9. That's not a spoiler. That's just an observation. I wouldn't pull on any thread on Odo. It probably be very exactly. sensitive. Exactly. I was as I said, it, I thought, and yeah, just just don't do that because it will just oh. <laughs> So this is what I'm saying. We can't get down this path. Um, the writers understandably don't clarify it because it gives them freedom to do whatever they want with the character in the future. And also it leads to some very disturbing conclusions. But Odo's physicality, uh, you know, and the nature of his being will become a major plot point in, in Deep Space Nine. So let's let's keep that on a back burner and, and, and come back to it. Um, at a later yes, time. Indeed. The next thing in this scene is um, Odo asking what makes Quark's clientele so very select. <laughs> and Quark <laughs> clarifies, they're all ridiculously wealthy and not too bright. <laughs> Which, for the current state of politics and the economy, is, yeah, it's very welcome. Wow, who knew DS9 with its, you know, uh, wry riffing on capitalism would remain so relevant, you know, 30 years on. I. Uh, I love that. I absolutely non fungible love that. tokens haven't even been thought of, and yet. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> I, I imagine Quark immediately being on on top of that with his yeah tired Ferengi, or yeah. instead of like lazy apes or whatever they those oh, NFTs were. <laughs> oh God, Ferengi with different era dominance. <sighs> Um, it's not impossible. But yes, that that very nicely leads into a little conversation where Quark is trying to determine the whether there is anything that Odo this. desires. I love this scene. And he, yeah, he, he says, isn't there anything you desire? A suit of finest Andoran silk, a ah. ring of pure Zorax, a complete set of tarnished pottery. How about a latinum plated bucket to sleep in? <laughs> And, and that there was a proper thinking moment, yeah. isn't there? And he really does consider it for a good five seconds and then goes in that wonderful Odo way. Where he just and Quark has a nice little, ha, moment of victory at the end of it. It's lovely. <laughs> but that, that whole scene is both brilliant for the characters, very good at developing them, uh, very funny, and also a lovely chance to talk philosophy. It, it's Quark's philosophy of more material... Of course, materialism is, is defined to me. It's my culture. Yes. Of course, as Odo accuses him of, what is your life? You just accumulate endless, mm -hmm. pointless material possessions, which then get handed down to your children, who then hand them down to their children, and on it goes, pointlessly. A very good observation, which yeah. obviously runs completely counter to a Ferengi, a good Ferengi's um, worldview, which is, of course, that's what I, that would be my heaven. And Odo yeah, that doesn't bother Quark at all. And, and you're just like, wow, these characters are coming from such different places, and yet they have such an amazing, antagonistic, <laughs> maybe, maybe um, something else relationship, because yeah. I know you've commented on that before. <laughs> and we're going to have sex. Yeah, they're the very best of enemies. <laughs> yeah, of course, they absolutely are. Um, obviously, I, and up there in the chat as well, the Indoor Cat is observing, is Odo a nudist? I don't think it works that way, because... <laughs> Odo appears to us as a, as a as a humanoid character, but that's not his natural natural state of being. So I'm going to argue no. I, I think if if we argued that he were, we'd have to say it was his kink, and he's very private about it. <laughs> and it's you know he works very carefully around it, so it doesn't offend anyone else. Nobody else gets you know you know squicked out by it. So okay, that I guess. Actually, works. he's very professional when he turns parts of himself into handcuffs with which to lead other people off. Good lord. <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, we've always made, made clear that this podcast is, you know, adults discussing adult themes. But, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to pursue that particular thread any further. I can't just, but. That's, that's absolutely fine. I can pick that up on my own time. You sure the you're next... not going to write anything? <laughs> I'm not telling you where I put it online. <laughs> The next scene Please. is a very unpleasant scene between Q and Vash. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, now, I bumped Vash on this is, as well. I think Vash is intending to leave. Yeah. Or, no, she can't be because they haven't had the auction yet, but she's no. walking with her um, 
in fact she must be walking towards the auction because she's got her bag yes. laden with things yes she's walking carrying it um that's right and in a conversation with Q, Q points out, do you remember that small insect bite that you received on, I haven't written down which planet it was. Um, he mentions all the planets, it'll be fine. He does. Um, so he mentioned this insect bite that Vash received, mm. implication being had Q not been there, it would have developed into, and in a flash, Vash has it lost happens. most of her hair. Yeah. In another flash a few moments later, she's covered in sores. Mm -hmm. Another moment later, she can no longer hold the bag. She's too weak and collapses to the floor. She makes noises of distress and discomfort and pain. She does, and people who are walking by have stopped to watch at this time because there is obviously something happening to this mm -hmm. woman. Um, and it's a very unpleasant display of powers. Yeah. That the flip side of it is, I was there to rescue you. Look what would have happened if I hadn't been there. But on the other hand, he is disabling a woman in real time. Yep. While she is she is arguing that it's over, she doesn't want to be with him anymore. There are some very ugly connotations to that, and I, I definitely have picked up on that. It is an overt form of coercion. Um, it is, and I, I think it's one of the places where, intentionally or not, it really does mirror the dynamics of an abusive relationship. Yeah, 100 you can't does. leave me, I won't let you leave me, you no. can't survive without me. I'll make things very bad for you if you do leave me. Yeah. Um, I've, I've jotted down that Q can't threaten to take away Vash's support network because she's such a, a rugged individual. She doesn't have True. one, she doesn't rely on a support network. No. So he takes away her physical health. He demonstrates yes. that he'll die, she'll die without him there. Mm -hmm. um, and just to touch on that theme, I don't think that the episode is trying to draw that allegory. I don't think it has anything to say about real-world no. abusive relationships. Mm. And I think that in terms of how it was written, the writers and producers would probably say that Fash is a strong female character. She's one of the I people who can stand up to Q, and she is, but he's omnipotent. And she's permitted to survive only by his whims. Mm. Um, mm. So it is, uh, yeah, it's a horrible moment and it's it a is. horrible aspect of Q that he is willing to abuse someone who has been with him at the point at which she chooses to leave him. Um, I made a note here saying nobody likes to see their problematic fave actually being problematic. So you have Spike in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Um, and that's I think a subject on which I know you are a, a consummate expert, so I'm very grateful for your input. I, 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 I like my, my incredibly overpowered bad boys. What can I say? <laughs> Um, but I think that as with Spike, it's important to acknowledge that aspect of, yeah. of Q rather mm. than saying, oh, the writers got this wrong. He, they didn't. No. Q is both a sweet little uwu princess who only wants to be around Picard forever and ever, and he's also an amoral arsehole who will murder people on a whim. Um, and I, oh, oh, I'm proud of this one. If you can't handle him at his literally murdering people, you can't have him at his mon capitaine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, that is brilliant. That, that is the kind of input I hoped you would bring to this because that is... This that is, is the fantastic. highlight of my year. <laughs> I've done nothing else creative. This is great. <laughs> but it's great. What a great way to sum it up. You're absolutely right it is. And and yeah, it is. It is everything you've described. And I think that's important because we need to remember that these are not two-dimensional characters. Mm -hmm. And they're also not allegory for real people. I, I think in some dramas, this would have been a story of Vash escaping from a relationship. Yes. It would have been a demonstration of how that works. Yes. It isn't, because Q is literally a god, mm -hmm. and he moves with his whims, and realistically, yes. no one can have an egalitarian relationship with him apart from another Q, who are all constantly fed up with his shenanigans. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, I also think it ties into what we right at the very beginning of our podcast describes as our own prime directive which is to remember that DS9 was written in the 90s and and you know discussions around these kind of things were simply not as advanced as they are today so I don't think the writers would have come at this thinking well, we need to consider the broader implications um, and how this is going to impact people who recognize this have lived through this situation what's going to stir you know so I also think that yeah this was thrown as a, as a nasty shock with no intention to be read any deeper which we can do, but, you know, if we do that, it, the episode simply won't stand up because it was never written to that depth as well. 
but that's also not to dismiss any of your very true observations of the Yeah, course, ab absolutely. We can we can lay our current readings on it yes. while acknowledging that that isn't what the writers intended. Yes. Death of the author. Um, okay. And that nowadays, had that been played out, there oh, would yeah. have been a content warning at the start so of the episode. More. There might have been a helpline at the end of the episode. Yep. Um, I think but, it would have been discussed more more in universe you know these kind of relationships yeah, are think, unsustainable unhealthy you know and i think one thing that is missing from this episode it doesn't pass the bechdel test i don't think bash has a single conversation with another female character um and i think that had they wanted to explore that relationship dynamic right. between her and q from her point of view they would have had that scene they would have had her talking to jadzia about why she went with him in the first place what went wrong why it couldn't work out and whether Vash still feels safe living in a universe yeah. that also has Q in it. Yeah. Um, I think that would have been a nice addition were this a different kind of episode. Uh, would, but I don't think there is room for it here. Yeah. No, I would I would absolutely agree. Uh but I, I like I like the idea of discussing what could have been. That's also a nice a nice way to I think approach mm -hmm. episodes like this. How could we have done it these days? And that would have been very good. I think somebody like Jazia definitely would have been an excellent person to talk to about it. Um, but yes, a shame as always. DS Nine suffers like a lot of shows from a uh, certain meddling that prevents certain good storylines from emerging. But we'll discuss that in the, <laughs> in the overrunning. Um, obviously, um, at the end of the scene, Q does restore Vash's health in that you know well, the nasty of uh, I've taken away, I can get back, or I have all the power in this relationship. But, you know, whole separate issue there. But um, the everyone are, and then somebody who is over to help Vash up. You know, and then she 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 hurries off down the promenade with many looks over her shoulders. Whilst the rest of the passerby is just kind of like, I just 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 like, what the hell was that all about? And I think they're getting into that. I imagine like the non crew of DS9 are like, okay, so now we live in a weird place, and weird stuff like this is probably going to happen on a regular basis. So they're starting to develop a defense mechanism, which is. Just, just be For careful somebody on the else's promenade. problem field. That's exactly what it is, you know. That's going on over there. And, you know, I don't want that to happen to me. And this is Starfleet. They bring weird with them. I'm just going to walk. If you don't watch this. it for too long, you won't get sucked into it. Just keep walking. That's just keep walking. It. It's that incredible, almost British, you know, style. <laughs> yes. You know, I'm just not going to not gonna notice that happening you know try and avoid it um and it just seems so weird <laughs> but understandable i think if well, i saw it's that a bit weird given that everyone's lives are in danger on a regular basis <laughs> and the majority of people are just going about their ordinary lives and that comes up later oh, on in God, the episode how much after. like earth that is right yeah we can make it to the stars and we're still the same kind of like oh, it's probably fine if i ignore it attitude oh guys come on we're meant to be the future oh the earth's getting warmer but the star trek here Oh, sometimes you need somewhere to escape to, and if it's not Star Trek, where the hell else are you going to go? My God. Um, so I have the next scene is another confab in Ops where they're discussing the problem some more. And they're talking about how dangerous the Graviton Flux is. It's really starting to damage the station. They're worried oh, about and O'Brien gets in a pop about Cardassian tech again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Never been to the internal power drain using these bloody Cardassian internal sensors. They're just not sensitive enough. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, interesting. Yeah, yes, uh, O'Brien, that you would be something's not sensitive when you are basically just slamming another culture, another race's technology. And I get that they are, you know, building up again. O'Brien's a veteran of a war with these people, and these people are as a as a rule and so far not been very nice with the exception of Garak. I, I, I did realise this week when watching when rewatching PNG, there's an mm. episode when O'Brien makes clear mm. to a Cardassian that he doesn't hate the Cardassians. Yeah. He hates what he became when he was fighting them. Yeah. He killed his first individual while confronting yeah. the Cardassians yeah. Yeah. and that changed him as a person. Yeah. And I think necessarily perhaps some of that nuance has been lost he now hates them again because yeah yeah because I they're the enemy because he's having that. to deal with their crappy tech on a day-to-day -day basis is. because and... they colonized bajor because yeah. they're the enemies in this series they in are. a way that they were one of many enemies in tng and we also have to um basically relearn or in some cases meet o'brien for the first time so it is yeah. a clumsy bit of character development um because, yeah, for those of us who have seen, seen TNG know, oh, well, you know, all of this has gone before. There was that great TNG episode, The Wounded, which talks in a really great way about the war with the Kardashians and what that does to people and how it can warp them and make them into very sad people who make very poor decisions. 
And yeah, I would absolutely agree that the nuance of that episode has been completely lost. And now Oda is just, uh, sorry, O'Brien is just um, a man who is angry against the Cardassians seemingly without reason. So it is a bit of a shame the way they've done that. Uh, but thankfully, character development is due for everyone. So hopefully that will not become a, a regular problem. Um, and they're talking about obviously having to get off the station, at which point... Q appears with his arm draped around Cisco. Another great cut where Cis yeah, Avery Brooks isn't moving too much, so it cuts together really well. And um, Q has this wonderful line, oh, please, Picard and his lackeys would have solved all this techno babble hours ago. <laughs> he says the word, he says the word techno babble. And I just felt again a Deadpool like view over everything Precisely. that's happening within this scripted episode of a television Precisely. series. Precisely delightful. Oh, it's it's mm -hmm. it's brilliant, and and he does as you always say. He lampshades a Star Trek trope, um, which is sitting around a table discussing your problems in a thoughtful, intelligent <laughs> way, and using a lot of technical terms uh, about graviton fluxes and y y yttrium gas and. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think it's is it titrium gas? Something like that. I don't take as very in-depth notes as you. I just tend to sketch what I like the most. I haven't written down what kind of gas it is, Dagnabbit. Mm -hmm. Oh well. I think it'll be okay. I think we can look at the uh, the broad <laughs> strokes, which is then um Q proceeding around the tables to dress down a few members of the Q of the crew. Uh, obviously Kira Brilliant. immediately um calls for security, boom, she's up ready for a fight and Q says ah what a feisty little go-getter either look out Cisco <laughs> I think this one wants your head in a platter which we know is not beyond well, I think he actually says she'll be after your job that's the one sorry yes yes and you know that does you know I accept that Q's omnipotent so he's going to know all of this but as just a surface read of the character yeah, he's got it pretty dead on. And and he's going for the kill. He's going for where the weak points might lie between the characters, what's most going to turn them against each other. Which is a lovely bit of character development in itself. I really enjoyed this scene. <laughs> oh, me too. Uh, um, he turns on O'Brien, um, who says, you know, you do something useful, like get out of our way, which is probably the most sensible thing anybody's said all episode, actually. Um <laughs> And, and Q's just like, do I know you? And he's like, Brian, from the Enterprise. And he actually goes, Enterprise, oh yes, one of the little people. And I'm like, <laughs> technically true, but unnecessary, you know? The Brian's now a main cast character, so get off his back. I think it's just so against the ethos of Star Trek to refer to any individual as being one of the unimportant mass, yeah, one of the little people. Star Trek respects people's individual right to life in a way that Q just doesn't 100%. So it's, yeah it's a nice way of setting you against the ethos of the show and also i think in ds9 more than in tng there will be more ex exploration of what yeah. it is to be working class on board a station like this and miles o'brien is the exemplar of that he's everyone's monkey in the first few episodes oh. he's having to run around fixing everything he's yeah. the only one who does serious work week to week <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, you're, you're and absolutely. He's one of the right. little people. I, I think, I think that is is Q again, lampshading Star Trek, um, in a way of, of noting. Oh well, you know what? Realistically, pal, you were like, you were in a, a few were very early. He was in the pilot of TNG, actually. I remember, um, and then he was the transporter chief. So he turns up as a background character in a few of the episodes. So behind the scenes, he is. He was a little person. So uh, it always feels like Q dunking on the show a bit. You know, <laughs> decades before Lower Decks turned up and actually introduced it as a whole series underpinning gag, there was Q going, you know, you're just one of the background characters. Don't get on my case. <laughs> Extra with a line. How dare you get out of my face? So, you know. Oh, the Indoor Cat tells us that it was ionised tritium gas. That's what we have really. the ensigns for. Which I, I really like the use of ionised tritium gas in this scene. Just that because they're not relying on Q to give them an mm. answer, because nothing else has been going wrong on the station, they've got a potential solution for finding out where the graviton flux is happening and the way is to release ionised tritium gas yep. tritium gas, and then to see where that flows, to see how how the, um, the flux is occurring and yep. where. But they can't release too much of it because it's toxic. I love that bit. So if they flood the station with it, they'll kill everybody. It's just a nice 
fictional technical problem mm -hmm. the, the, whereby they can't the just resolve it quickly using yeah. that and it ups the stakes it ups the tension mm -hmm. there is a, there are decisions to be made here cisco has to decide how far to go with this dangerous gas how far to turn off the systems of the station yeah. to ensure that the power drain doesn't occur any further mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and when to boost it again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, it's, great. It's, it's it's just nice it's, it's it feels proper in a world where you can just throw around terms like graviton field and not have it mean much. We've got a very definite concrete occurrence here. Mm -hmm. People will die if a gas is released. We mm -hmm. have to try and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it is balancing competing problems when, yes. yeah, you would normally just call up somebody like Geordi and be like, Geordi, can you rewrote A through B through the navigational deflector? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, absolutely, that'll save the day. And you're like, uh, okay, then. Great. So, yes, I, I do love that it, it, it does up the tension very effectively there. I'm also just going to note that Q calls Cisco Benji, which I found I love that. incredibly <laughs> jarring. So cheeky. I mean, just peak Q. You just, you just wouldn't. No one would call Benjamin Cisco oh, Benji. It really jars with me, you know. You, you would not, would you? Um, so. But I like that towards the conclusion of this scene, mm. um, Q tells Cisco that while the team are running around engaging in pointless guesswork to find out what's destroying the station, Vash is below engaged in base commerce and setting Federation ethics back 200 years. Believe me, gang, she's far more yeah. dangerous to you than I. <laughs> and I, I love that thrown in word gang again. It lampshades the fact that this is the core cast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is the Scoobies. Who That's exactly what I thought. I thought... <laughs> Years in, in, Buffy, in one of the later series of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, they refer to each other as the Scooby Gang because that's what they are. They run around solving mysteries and saving things. Mm -hmm. the um, moment and yeah, I that's heard what gang. she was identified here. Yep. The moment I heard Gang, I thought, my God, like the Scooby Gang from Buffy. So yes. again, it is cute lampshading, you know, those Star Trek things. And I just thought it was great. So a brilliant scene, a brilliant scene. I love that one. Uh, the next one I have is um, the visitors coming to uh, into the bar. Um, uh, it's I... Kolos, I think, is the guy who approaches Quark yes. and Vash. And he's wearing a beautiful outfit. It's in lots of different rainbow colours. I think there are gold Chunky elements necklace. to it. Yes, because he's Looks one of fantastic. the rich people who is going to attend the auction. Mm -hmm. He's just rolling in um, gold pressed latinum, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he looks like it. Mm. Um, so he wanders up to Quark and Vash, who are welcoming people to the auction. Um, and oh, before I think, yeah, he refers to Quark as an obsequious toad, which shows very good judgment on his part. I mean, he's not wrong, is he? He, he is absolutely not wrong. Um, and he asks for, you know, what what's the legitimacy and. Quark says, our oh, Vash is the Federation's foremost expert on the Gamma Quadrant, which is technically correct, because she's the only person from the Federation who's come back from the Gamma Quadrant so far, which isn't technically, and it, I just love it, it's like a fudging of the facts, it's like, she is But at the same time, as we learn in a bit, she does know a lot about the civilizations of the Gamma Quadrant, I mean, he, he would have said that anyway, but he absolutely would have. <laughs> um, You're absolutely right. Oh, um, uh, that when Quark and Vash are discussing the uh, attendees, Quark mm. describes them as honest collectors of antiquities, everyone, and Vash says, how honest? And Quark replies, as honest as you and I. <laughs> and then which is a Vash perfectly says, truthful response. Yeah, which causes Vash to say, well, we'd better keep a close eye on them then, hadn't we, Quark? And it's like, yeah, we're all friends and enemies here, aren't we? Oh, yes, we all know what She's we are. She's just so well suited to his world. Perfect. It's brilliant. It it's is... a lovely pairing up of characters. I'm so glad they brought her back for this. I'm going to dig into really minor detail here. I love the little DS9 mugs with the flared base and the toys. I haven't spotted those. They were in the background, oh. the, uh, the the poor alien with the oh, brilliant flat gold top. Oh, he some rat's top. mail to him, doesn't he? Give oh. me a synth ale and he gets one of them flared bases with the narrow top. And I'm like, God, their mugs look great. Could tip one of them over. I've always wanted one. So if anybody sees them, I'm sure they're out there somewhere on Etsy or something. I must have one. And I shall use it in future episodes to drink my wine but i love those little mugs uh so yes so the auction mm, the auction is about to begin but the next note i have is that the station is now moving the station yes is getting the station drunk. started moving this is where they use the thrusters it's being pulled towards the wormhole yep. Yep. um so they use the thrusters to try and stabilize it to keep it where it should be 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the tension mounts. It does indeed, which is a great time for the auction to begin. And, um, and Vash and begins. It, with the and it opens with Vash telling the assembled crowd about the culture of Verathen, the Verathen civilization. I am um, placing the statue in its historical context. And I, I looked up, she describes it as being the possession of one of the first Osamites. And Osamite was a word completely made up for this context. Really? There's no such yeah, there's no such role when you type it into Google, it brings up this episode. Brilliant. Um, That's a nice little bit of tiny world building by the writers. Well done. I love that. It's lovely. She gives so much information. She starts to give so much in-depth information about this culture. Yeah. And is then interrupted by Quark. What are you doing? I'm placing it in this historical context. Of course, like, that's not what these people want. Okay, and he I'm turns around and becomes the best auctioneer I've ever seen. Friends, it's old. It's expensive. And it's one of a kind. You want it. And you can tell they're going, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, mean, I do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you've oh. boiled it down to what I understand. A rich idiot. I understand that it's <laughs> unique expensive and if i have it nobody else has it and it just it flicks all the switches in their little lizard brains and they're like yeah 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 elon what, musk what, would what? be the first bidder <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant i the whole auction every bit of the auction scene is great especially when q pipes up at the back to say yeah i just wanted to let everyone know the station is currently <laughs> hurtling towards its doom and none of you will have any time in which to enjoy your purchases just thought I'd point that out of civic mindedness and just like like Q one, you would never do that. To you <laughs> transparent mischief loving goblin. I can't believe this. I can't believe this. <laughs> and Quark's response is to offer everyone free drinks and free use of the hollow suite for the end of the auction. And people he, stay. It's brilliant. He will be the oh. man selling people like life preservers off the deck of their Titanic, even as the water comes up past his knees. There is a man who will pursue profit under all you know just all circumstances it's kind of admirable yeah. it, it is it is admirable <laughs> and in the midst of this q um offers that he will save vash if only she'd ask <sighs> and she says she'll take her chances with the others she's had enough of him <laughs> it's, it's a great little great little moment that where she's like you know what yeah i know we're in doom but this is still preferable to you know the just the, the life with you plus also let's not forget she knows jean luc picard she knows you know, that Q Lamb said it earlier, but that swooping at the last minute to save the day actually usually works quite a lot in this universe. So I, I think at the back <laughs> of her mind, she's like, it's a Starfleet crew. They're masters of solving the day with like minutes to go. I'll probably be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, very true. Oh, the Indoor Cat points out Quark has the SEO down, Vash has the archaeology degree. <laughs> That's absolutely yeah. right. They yeah. make a really good team in that yeah. respect. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, now is the time for marketing to take over. You know, <laughs> don't worry about it, guys. Sit back. Um, uh, so I've got a note that one of the uh, one of the winning bidders is Rule the Obscure, and he's one of the characters that has like the blue blanket over their faces. Very. Oh yes, I liked that. You see, just see. I think for the first time, you see a few of them walking through the station on yes. their way to the auction. Sorry, that's right, you do. Yeah, and it's a little like a hijab, but with no space for the eyes. It's Absolutely. just a blue just wrap around the head. Completely. Yeah. It's very striking and obviously very good for maintaining anonymity. Very like and that. The obscure. the obscure. I love it. You know, for a character that has no lines, is on on scene for yeah, probably less than two minutes. Brilliant. Love it. And it gets you a bit away from just, you know, uh, humanoid, two arm, two legs, bumpy forehead, which is obviously one of Star Trek's ongoing failings. So it was a slightly better alien design. I, I like Rule the Obscure. I really enjoyed that. Um... I think we've then got a little mm. bit more technical problem solving. They're discussing whether to yes. turn the energy back up. Mm. Um, well, blah, blah, blah. what are they actually doing? The team are trying to trap the energy drain from the tritium gas, but the gas is toxic, it's a high amount, well, it results in the death of everyone on board the station. They can pump the energy up so the drain will be more obvious, but that will result in the station being propelled at higher speed towards the wormhole. Mm -hmm. It's that trading off of, of risks, which is good. It, it, it keeps ratcheting yeah. up the pressure. It's but I think good. it's at this point that Dax points out that given that they're being dragged towards the wormhole anyway, if they pump up the power at this point, the tritium gas will have enough of a reaction that they can very quickly hone in so, on where the source of the graviton flux is and track it down. So it's a risk worth taking. Mm -hmm, it is. Uh, Cisco makes a decision it's a risk worth taking. 
Top marks to Dax. I love that Dax is being used as a science officer should. She has the key to the solution. She is the Spock or the data. You know, she is, you realise she is now the ideas person. She's very intelligent, very good at problem solving. I, I love that although Dax got such a low profile in this episode, she still had, you know, the key to it all at the end, which I loved. Uh, meanwhile, back in the auction hall, um, Kolos puts puts in a bid by raising his six fingered hand to bid six hundred <laughs> um, bars of gold press latinum. That? For... That's a delightful. <laughs> it's such a tiny little weird thing, but it's so effective. Um, I think by now they are now bidding on the object, which is still undescribed. That they're still like, you know, look at this wonderful, isn't it gorgeous with its glow and its. And I'm like, this thing. what do you think it is? What do you think you are describing? Is it a gem? Is it a, uh, an orb? What is this thing? And nobody... I guess that partly drives the bidding. No one knows what it That's is. What it's it a is. new object. It's Never so seen obscure. before. Who knows what it's capable of? It might be a new energy source. It might yeah. be the cure for diseases we haven't even heard of yet. It's, yeah, Who it could be anything. Bid it's me this MacGuffin. Drinking. It's, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. But you know, we start to realise now that this might be the key, the key to everything. Um, the crew come storming out of a turbo lift. They're following the tricorders now onto the promenade, where everyone's just stood around quite casually. Even though I know that the station is currently moving at very high speed, and if you were to just look out of one of the many windows, you would see the stars flying by, which they do well, not do normally. Looking at the auction objects, they're intrigued. But there's other people on the promenade who aren't even in the auction, who are just stood around, like, having a normal day. Do they all assume that Starfleet's going to fix it at the last minute? I... We've just established that if they haven't got an immediate solution for it, they ignore it. And That's eventually exactly get it. what it is. They're all just going, I'm going to ignore the stars flying by that we're currently flying through It'll space. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> be fine. Starfleet'll fix it. It'll be fine. Comfort. <laughs> um... So, yes, so uh, the crew pile into the auction house where Q has just bid, where he first bids 2,501 bars of God press Latin, and, yes. and everybody looks at him like, you rank amateur, who who bids plus one? <laughs> you know, don't be a loser. So then Q goes, fine, one million bars of gold press Latin, and everybody just goes actually crazy, and Quark grabs his head and is like, one million bars of gold press Latin. <laughs> Made for life. One going twice and the crew are struggling through the crowd three times <laughs> and i think just as jack says it's in this box quite goes sold sold no longer oh, leaving my the final. <laughs> I love it. it's perfectly timed i love how that scene is is written so yeah, the well indoor, the indoor cat says 14 seconds of the wormhole and the auction seems unbothered when profit is a, is is you know on the table everything else <laughs> is irrelevant you know even if, I think it's a Brian says, you know, if we hit the wormhole, we'll be in a billion pieces by the time we reach the Gamma Quadrant. And you're like, that sounds painful. So, yeah, but people's yes, we have, we have established that the uh, station will be broken up as it goes through the wormhole. Yeah. It won't just travel through in one piece. It no. will be torn apart by it. It will be absolutely <laughs> shredded. So, yeah, yeah, good, good bit of tension building there. Um, but, yes, they've tracked it. It is whatever this glowing object is, the undescribed object in the box, is the source of the graviton problems the station is suffering, and um, I think as Dax holds up a sensor to it, yes. the graviton field is getting stronger and stronger. It's like, oh, God, we've got to get rid of this object now. So um, Cisco does what Star Trek loves to do, which is take your comm badge off, throw it on something you want beamed into space, and <laughs> yes. beam it. And somehow, like the transporters know, if your comm badge is sitting on something, you want that thing to go. <laughs> Great, that's very helpful. Also, they're able to beam something which is emitting such powerful gravity waves, it's breaking the whole station. I thought, do you know what? They used exactly that same gambit in the first episode that had fashion. Did they? Because I was again, there was an object years. of great power that they yeah. wanted to, that Picard wanted to get rid of, so he throws yeah, was, down his combat. I think he sets a particular protocol beforehand. He contacts Riker and says, I want you to use this protocol. And Riker says, This protocol, really? Yes. And the protocol presumably is. Slap the com badge on something and then transport it transport far into space. Me. Okay, yeah. so it's a it's a little bit of a tired Star Trek solution, but fair or enough. Or it's a deliberate reference to something that previously happened. And you know what? You're, you're probably so. right. Actually, that would make sense. It would be a nice callback, wouldn't it? Um, and it's a, it's also a very neat solution because it does it gets the box off the station very quickly. 
Um, so that it can turn into a magical manta ray type creature that then flies through a wormhole and disappears. Had they tried to destroy it, had they done anything else with it, that couldn't have happened. And the creature is never mentioned again. Never ever mentioned again. No. It's be I, I loved that. It just feels like such a whimsical solution to the problem. This MacGuffin just turns into a magical animal that then disappears. Okay. It's kind of beautiful. It's a bit reminiscent of the aphasia episode where they uh, there's just a log at the end from Cisco going... And then we cured everyone. This time it's the, the, the object turned into a blobby alien and it flew away. And, and everyone flown was safe back to Warbat and everyone's fine. And I'm like, guys, once again, were you running a bit close to the uh, runtime? Were you like, oh, we, we better wrap it up now. We better wrap it up. It's true. Exterior shot of the station. Cisco says it's fine. It's fine. You know, and I'm like, wasn't bits of the station falling off five minutes ago? Uh, okay. Okay. That's fine. You know, I, I get that they, they, they solved it in the dying minutes and therefore there wasn't a lot of after analysis, which is not really something that is a Star Trek thing today. And they don't seem to have a xenobiologist on board, so no one's going, what was that creature? We need to log this. We need yeah. to send reports to Starfleet. God yeah. damn it. You know, if we run into these things again, they, they, they give off such gravity waves that they could tear an entire space station apart. We, we need to know. They could be the new Borg. We need to deal. No, nice no, gone. don't care. Gone. Gone. <laughs> Just, just wrap things up, guys. Wrap things up. <laughs> um, but they do, you know, and then it's just um, the talking, talking wrap up, which is Q and Bash at the bar. Yes. And I noted one interesting, I found it interesting thing in this conversation. When Q is listing things from Earth history to demonstrate how, one, this as well. <laughs> how uninterested, he breaks the usual rule of three. Yes. Right. That usually, whenever you've got a list of three things from Earth, three places, three scientists, three musicians, you've got two from real Earth history mm -hmm. up to the 20th century, yep. and one from post 20th century to demonstrate that the characters are in a future that's beyond the us. Fictional and Q, Exactly. And Q doesn't. Instead, they go for a kind of cheap de escalation by saying the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, Watergate. <laughs> I mean, the bell riots don't warrant to mention. <laughs> you shouldn't know about them yet. That's cheating. <laughs> you are using Q powers to look into the future or the past or both. <laughs> but you're right. It is so. It is so bizarre. It seems to be heading in that. I love. I love a, a nice rule of three. I think it's a great way to do quick world building. I think it's great. So for them to. It's nice, and it just feels very sitcomish. Yeah, yeah, it just it feels is. like a very cheap joke for yeah, an older generation it than the generation is. who's actually watching. It's just a very strange choice. What a gay. I just, it absolutely yeah. comes out of left field and leaves me. I'm just, I've seen that episode a hundred times, and every time I'm always like, why? I just really bump on that really hard. It makes no sense at all. So I'm glad you picked up on that. I'm, as glad, well. you, I'm glad you picked up on it too. It wasn't just me being finicky. No, very strange. <laughs> But there is a beautiful moment after that, which mm. I, I I made a note earlier that I wish this conversation had happened, and then it happens, much to my delight. Q explains to Vash yes. why having her with him was valuable. And he says, when I look at a gas nebula, all I see is a cloud of dust. Seeing the universe through your eyes, I was able to experience wonder. I'm going to yeah. miss that. Oh, and it's a rare so... moment of vulnerability from Q in a relationship with another person in terms of what he is capable and not capable of. And it's, yeah, after a, a rather unpleasant relationship between the two of them for the whole episode, mm. I think that does feel like a nice way to wrap it up. He isn't lording it over it or isn't no. saying, well, go, but I still have power over you. He's saying, you gave me something that I cannot do without you, yeah. and that's why I liked having you around. I think it does level the playing field between them slightly. It does. And I think it, it ties into what we've been discussing earlier about Q, which is that he's not just, you know, a, mis mis a mischievous prankster. He does have some kind of responsibility towards humans in, in his own very twisted way. So he's like, Or at least he's got a deep vested interest. Yeah, yes, in that's a better way. Of he finds it. them yeah. so fascinating that he can't bear the idea of all of them disappearing. He finds yeah. it valuable to see the world through their eyes for all that we're just, you know, very limited ape creatures. <laughs> oh, but yeah, yeah. No, I think you're <laughs> absolutely right. It is, it is a nice little bit of character building for Q, you know, that he's not just here to cause trouble, but he actually benefits from his relationships with us. And I'm sure you have so much more to say about his relationships with with <laughs> Picard and how he benefits from them. But again, we'll we'll save that for uh, another we day. 
Um, and at the end of this hmm. scene, partly due to her conversations with, I think we missed the conversation she has with Quark, where she's telling him, "Now I'm going to go and retire to Earth yes. now. Sorry, take yes, my earnings did. and just Cross, go to Earth, live a quiet right. life." Hmm. And he says, "You wouldn't last a month." He says, "You're too much like me." He thinks that she's after the profit motive. Yeah. She's too much of a business person. She won't settle in one place. Yeah. Q has told her that she won't ever settle in one place because yeah. she's too adventurous. And having heard both of them and having acquired enough money to go wherever the heck she wants. <laughs> yeah, she decides she's going to go to Tataris 5. She's going to go back to that life. And I, I wondered about that because I wasn't sure if the episode was trying to say you can leave this kind of slightly sketchy life behind and, and you know, go back to what you kind of should be doing in a, in a Star Trek Starfleet Federation world, which is be the academic you're meant to be and follow the rules. And I was like, I'm not sure what's the best way out here so i was honestly curious what do you think this was the right ending for vash i do because i think that had she gone cool. and become a quiet academic it yeah. goes against everything we know of the woman she follows yeah, her own path right. that she continues right. to she's had two other people look at her and go no that's not who you are when she said she's going to retire and yeah, for all that they're rogues and scoundrels right exactly was going to be my next point <laughs> but they're of a type with her they got along You're with right. her as well as they did because You're right they're all that way minded. And I think it would have been a shame for Vash to have become a very quiet, retiring person who gave the occasional lecture and bumped into Jean Luc Picard at the odd Daystrom Institute Archaeology <laughs> Council <laughs> dinner. I can't see it happening. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that she continues to have. <laughs> it's the thing that really annoys me at the end of the C.S. Lewis Narnia books that they continue to have adventures forever. And every adventure is better than the last. <laughs> Oh, it's right. how C.S. Lewis construed heaven but I think that for Vash we, I don't, as far as I know we don't see her again in universe and the like last that. time we see her she's off on more adventures and that's that's what she has forever she gets to have more like adventures that. with excitement and really wild things <laughs> yeah, <that's great. laughs> cool thank you because I, I was not sure in myself hmm. what the episode was trying to push me towards or what Vash should have been going towards so yeah I think I like the way you clarified that 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 is Vash's natural conclusion so, yeah, I like that. Um, I'm going to note that Q said maybe I could drop in on you sometime and Vash <laughs> whirls on him instantly and got, oh, God, I hope not. Brilliant line delivery. You know, just absolutely no perfect delivery. Love that. Um, and so, you know, Vash says to Quark, you know, what's the, uh, what's the quickest way I can get from here to Tartarus 5? And as she goes yes. out, and they're arm, they're arm in arm discussing Tartarus Five as they walk off scene. Great, we can assume they go on to further adventures and uh, quite make some money out of it. Um, and there's no she, bad yeah. blood there. I think when the episode ends, other than Cisco and Q, who we don't see together again, everyone mm. is on good terms. It's a light-hearted yes. episode, ultimately. You're absolutely for all right. No, you're absolutely right. Um, and it does, it does end very light-hearted, as, again, the aphasia episode did with a gag with a Brian looking chagrined as Cisco demands his replicator, coffee be hotter. Um, Bashir <laughs> wanders in yawning, oh, I feel slept for days to Dax of all people who just happens to be in the bar. Um, and he's like... And I think she doesn't say a word to him. She doesn't say she a just word kind to him. It's very weird. <laughs> it's very weird, but Bashir's there looking boggled, unsent because he's been asleep for, like, yeah, 12, 24 hours. Um... <laughs> And he's like, did I miss anything? And Dax just gives she just a kind of raises an eyebrow at it. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's nice. It is nice. It's a bit odd. Um, I just, I, just I think it is a bit strange for Jadzi not to have something to say. But I think it's also, it's leaning on she doesn't have to say something. They know yeah, each other know well enough right. that she can just give him a look and he will know that he has missed something but not yeah. know what and she also looks a little bit coy i think that's a re-establishing yes. of bashir has been flirting with someone else at the top of the episode but at the end of the episode he's come back to jadzia and as the episodes go on we can assume he will continue to do so you so yeah it, and again that that episode ends nicely based in characters who are on deep space nine yes. after so it's spent with characters from elsewhere. Yes. It's yeah, it's a very it's a very short ending and it just works well, I think, to reground us in the in the universe that we're in now. It is, it is that it is a return to status quo without being a, a hard reset, which we've discussed uh, elsewhere, yes. is uh, sometimes a bit disappointing in a fictional in a fictional show. So yeah, it's not a hard reset, but it is a nice return to form, as you say. 
that is the end of my notes, Kat. So um, is there anything we've glossed over that you would like to bring up or should we just kind of sum up our thoughts on the episode? Let's see. I've done my usual highlights, lowlights and favourite mm -hmm. quotes. Mm -hmm. So my favourite things in the episode, I really enjoyed Vasha's character in it. She she's great. chaotic. She's entirely self-serving. She knows a heck of a lot about archaeology across more than one galaxy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She uses that knowledge to pursue wealth and to seduce powerful men in her ploys to make herself even more wealthy. Um, I think it's very clear in the episode why she and Q would be drawn to one another and mm. why it didn't work out between them. Yes, I think her being drawn to Quark similarly, I think those two characters work wonderfully together. Um, and I think the way the episode is written makes great use of her character. And yes. that both Jennifer Hetrick, who plays Vash, and John Delancey, who plays Q, do a really good job of playing their characters consistently yes. with the way they played them in the last Star Trek episode that they were both in, which was filmed over two years previously. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I think I'm running to the end of being able to speak. Um, <laughs> but I am, so I'm very glad that Vash particularly was able to come back for a last episode. I think I think you're absolutely right, and that's such a good thing to know is that these um, these actors are playing characters um, years apart with no kind of um, intervening uh, familiarisation with them, but they jump back into the role brilliantly. Um, and more than that, I think it, it shows a real strength that DS9 has and will continue to develop, which is you can have whole scenes set around two people which are not part of the main cast. And it, oh, they are brilliant. They are brilliant, occasionally troubling, uh, problem problematic, but still brilliant scenes. So it's a real kind of win. I think it's a real victory for the writing, direction, production of the show that, you know, yeah, Q and Vash, John Delancey and... Uh, what was her name? Jennifer Hetrick. Jennifer Hetrick. Kudos to them both for just absolutely carrying scenes entirely on themselves with characters they I haven't revisited in years. Yeah, I, I, I did a bit of opening far too many tabs while researching the episode. And one of the writers said about that scene that they've been told to write a lengthy scene between Vash and Q in, mm. in Vash's quarters, just talking between themselves. And they throw in so many humorous moments, so many troubling moments. Mm. And... Yeah, it's just it's just so well written and very concisely written that all of this happens within a what forty five minute episode. Yeah. And as you say, there's a lot of world building within DS9 as well as having two characters who some people don't recognise, but they adequately introduce them yes. so that they can play out together. Oh, it's just I just love it so much. It's just so nicely done, and it's and it really balances, I think, the comedy with the growing tension of mm -hmm. what's happening abroad. Although we can assume that the station isn't actually going to be destroyed. It would um, be a strange Star Trek show if that did happen. <laughs> I mean, we've we've had the Enterprise destroyed before, but there's always been a nice handy big red reset button somewhere in it. Um, so it's yes. not impossible that that kind of danger happens in Star Trek. Um, I'm, I'm going to say, in general, then, we, we seem to be having, and I don't want to jinx it, but we seem to be having quite a good run of first episodes in the first season, which most Star Trek fans will tell you is unlikely, because most first seasons of Star Trek shows are uneven at best. So Absolutely. I think the first, the opening episodes of Deep Space Nine are definitely preferred to the opening episodes of The Next Generation. Wow. But... I, you know, I'd seen some later episodes of TNG. It could see where the characterization had developed into. I don't know that about DS9 yet. Yeah, no, that's true, actually. Um, so it will be very interesting then to see what you think of the, the arcs these characters are going to go on and whether or not you think that improves or, or actually decreases your kind of opinion of the characters. Mm -hmm. um, but I am very pleased to hear that you are having a good impression, not mainly because that would make this a very hard podcast if you were like, I'm actually coming to hate the show and everyone in it. <laughs> And I'd be like, but we've got like seven more years. Cap, you can't, you can't go. You've got to stay here and talk about them. So there's um... a lot to be said for a good hate watch. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, it won't come to that. There um... are characters coming down the line that you are going to love to hate, but I'm not going to spoil it very on that. And it will be very interesting to see what you make of that. Before we finish, I'm going to give yes. one quote that I really enjoyed that we haven't mentioned, um, and it's the com it's in the conversation between Vash and Q in her quarters. Um, Vash says, "You're the one who almost got me killed on a rare King Seven, and weren't they? And they weren't exactly thrilled to see you on Brax either. What did they call you? The God of Lies?" And Q says, "They meant that affectionately." <laughs> I I love that. I I 
that scene was, I, I did know that scene was incredible for just listing places and names and cultures. And it must have been a devil to remember an act, but they were. Really yeah, I think the two actors spent a lot of time together memorizing their lines oh because there were so damned many. Oh my God, so complex. In, in a show that already, you know, deals with a lot of like crazy names, that was incredibly intense, but brilliant. Brilliant work by the pair of them, as you say. Oh, love that, love that. So, another victory then, we would say, for season one? I think so, yeah. I'm just I'm just sad that Q isn't going to come back and, and jibe with Garrick. It just seems like, yeah, like such a... I, I've, I've never been able to dig into why, and that will be interesting actually to understand why. Um, but they don't I, bring I suspect back. that it is just because he doesn't fit with their universe so well. They don't want... That nonsense. It's possible. <laughs> to DS9 so often. But sorry, I cut you off then. And, well, I'm just going to say they do have other episodes where they have absolutely crazy stuff happening, but it's mm -hmm. not Q related. And you're like, oh, I could see Q fitting into this. But I think mm -hmm. perhaps I might be right that there was a worry that Q started to dominate TNG a bit, you know, that he always popped up and he always created episodes which were very divisive among the fan base. So I wonder if they were trying to avoid that. They were very bold to bring him back for the final episodes of TNG then, because without Q, none of that happens. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. No. Uh, no, I think a very a very valuable resource when he's used correctly. But uh, yes. uh, danger in the wrong hands. <laughs> absolutely. I think I like Q best when he's having battles of wits with other characters. There are some beautiful quotes fall out of Q episodes, as we've seen yes. with this one. They tend to be written with very expansive vocabularies and a lot of very well-placed insults, which I enjoy tremendously. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think I think for Deep Space Nine, that played to those strengths. You know, there were some great one-liners from Q and from other characters. So it was a very good Q episode that had to be set on DS9. Brilliant. No yeah, complaints. I can agree. Loved it. And next episode mm -hmm. is called Dax. Episode. I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to getting more into Dax's character. It is a brilliant episode and it is a good Star Trek episode as well. It plays to a lot of familiar Star Trek tropes, um, but uh, is a fantastic character development for Dax and for other members. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to get into it. I'm going to say then to our loyal fans that that will be... This is the 30th today... Maybe, hopefully, we're in for the 13th of November. I could hear a cat in the background. There is a cat yelling at me. Which and it's is, not the indoor cat in the chat. It is not the indoor cat. It is the uh, in-room cat that is telling me it's getting late. <laughs> I have a good point. We've talked for over two hours. The episode develops as it does. So we will just say this will be on YouTube soon. And I would like to thank everyone in chat who stuck with us through it all. Nigel, the indoor cat, everyone who's popped in and said hello. We're very grateful to you all for joining us. Hello. Meow. Hello. And um, yes, this has been Deep Space Wine. I've been Tim. And I've been Cat. We have enjoyed your company. That was that episode. And we will hopefully see you all again in a couple of weeks' time. Bye for now. Take care, live long and prosper. Good night. <laughs>